What's going on, family? Hey, let me just do a, a real brief intro real quick before I bring the bros on. Uh, first and foremost, you already know it's your brother, Naheem, BKA Lord Abba, AKA Mr. Just The Facts. Family, hit that like button. Share this one out. This is, this is important. We might do this over two nights. We might do a part two to this tomorrow night, it is impossible, absolutely impossible for us to cover everything that we would like to cover in one night. If you are new to the channel, hit that subscribe button. Hit that subscribe button. Click the little bell icon next to the subscribe button so that you can get notifications every time we go live and become a part of the notification nation got be the power in the building uh, is everybody is in the building shout out to everybody that's in the chat right now <laughs> we we're gonna try to get into this thing i'm gonna bring my bros on real quick we got brother josh in the building we got dr logic supreme in the building and tonight we are going to be talking about this book that we've been talking about since last year the bloody shirt can y'all see it the clear from the light is the bloody shirt. Y'all see that Confederate flag there? Terror after the Civil War. Terror after the Civil War. And um, we've read excerpts out this book. We've suggested this book to the family for at least a year now. At least a year. So we want to do a, you know, we, well, we've been wanting to do the book club on the book. We're just now getting into it. So I want to start by saying that I just took a little notes to, to start things off with. In this book, you will find not only the account of white supremacy, but its manifesto, period. <laughs> this book has reprints of the actual letters. And I'm going to get into some of that in the intro. The Ku Klux Klan, the White League, the Confederates and all of the racists by whatever name they go by or went by is the largest criminal network in this nation's history. Don't ever, ever let them tell you anything else, ever. It is, was, 
slash is the largest criminal network in this nation's history. The Italian mafia have has nothing on the Confederates, nothing on the Ku Klux Klan and the the White League and the red shirts and et cetera, et cetera. They have nothing on them. Some of the things that I learned in this book, Negro leader, it was a, it was a buzzword that was used by the Confederate rebels to set their sights on certain prominent individuals like Prince Rivers, who we're going to get to tonight try to shut him down, drown him out, destroy him, kill him. It's a term that we've heard prefixed to our great leaders like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., right? Negro leader. Malcolm X, Negro leader. These were buzzwords. See, this book opens our eyes up to many, many realities that we've witnessed with our own eyes but began with these Confederates in the South. And the Neo-Confederates are carrying on that tradition in more subtle ways, of course. This book shows you how the newspapers of that time, they were the most complicit. They basically wrote the script that the Confederates could use to lie their way out of everything. Everything, much like Fox News did today. If you followed the um, Kavanaugh hearings, and they had, what was her name, Blase Ford. Oh, they wrecked her. The media wrecked her. When Trump had the Ukrainian phone call and the colonel by the name of Vindman sat in and said exactly what happened on the call that Trump lied about, Oh, Fox News was right there. Oh, they called that man everything, a spy for the Ukrainians. This is what they did back in those days. And this book, The Bloody Shirt, highlights the origins of what we see today. We are in Reconstruction 2.0. So before I start reading, I want uh, Brother Logic, um, you know, give your you know, your view of the book and where we're going to go with this thing tonight. Ah, man. Yo, family. The Bloody Shirt. I got so much to say about this piece of work and how much it means to me personally. And when you think about like, like for my suggestion, my recommendation for anybody out there, if you really want to be astute and adept in Friedman history and understanding the Friedman story, you have to get this book. You must be well versed in the information and the history that is the bloody shirt. Right. You will. It, it's such a it's such a beautiful book. Right. It reads like a horror fiction novel, but it's <laughs> actual facts. It's That's actual right. facts. It's our history. You understand? And it's so pertinent and crucial to our civil rights justice work that we're we're fighting for today because it outlines in great detail the beginnings, the genesis and the of all of the. The lies all of the political moves against the freedmen. And it really fleshes out how, how and why freedmen is the only accurate identifier for our people, especially when in regards to this specific civil rights justice work that we're doing. Because policy is specific and the policies that are archived in the bloody shirt specifically mention a certain group of people and they called them the freedmen right two sets of policies one by those who would pose as our uh, allies and and friends and another one another set of policies from those who outrightly are enemies right and so the the union and the united states government made policies sp specifically for the freedmen 
in language and definition. You understand? And so did our enemies, the Confederates. If you go and analyze the, the, the earliest writings of black codes, you will see Freedmen in the language, right? If you go look at some of the inaugurational speeches and some of the petitions from the citizens of the various former Confederate states, you will see Freedmen in the legislation. We're going to flesh that out for you tonight. You understand? And we're going to talk to you like if, if, if you are trying to repair damage done to a, our specific group, the Freedmen is that specific group. And you know that because of the language our enemies use, our victimizers use this language. And so we don't have to like the term. We, I, it, it really is. That's a personal thing, whether you like the term, whether it sits well in your heart or rolls off your tongue smoothly or not. It's, it's <laughs> personal. But the actual fact of the matter is when we're talking about this reparatory justice work, it can only be done for this specific group and the targeted specific group that government, state and federal use in its in set in its genesis was freedmen. We are freedmen now doing this freedmen work. And this right here is the number one book for all freedmen because it not only captures the heinous crimes against our people, but it also archives the glorious progress and uh, achievements and just just outright marvelous magnificence of our people at the same time. So with that being said, we're about to get into this thing. I don't I don't know if any of the other brothers are going to tell you how they feel about this book, but we've been reading excerpts from this book for over a year. We're about to really get in and dissect this thing, family. Stay tuned. Indeed, indeed, yeah. brother Josh. Yeah, go ahead, brother Josh. Yeah, decide to hop in. Peace, everybody. Um, let me put me put my little camera on today. Hold up, hold up. Got something a little different going on. Yeah, I had to put my little camera on for the day. <laughs> anyways, Josh, um, Josh cut the what? What was the the character from the Boondocks? Huey. Oh yeah, Huey. Huey, Huey for a wall. <laughs> yeah, I mean, when I think about this um this book and just going through it, you know, it's it's it for me. It was difficult to read for long periods of time. It's one of those that you gotta you gotta read and process it. You gotta calm down. You gotta make sure you can if you if you're listening to it. You gotta make sure you're driving. Uh. You make sure you're driving um, safely and um, you definitely don't need to come across any kind of road rage. Right. But. Yeah, I got through it piece by piece. But, you know, it's like. If you think that um, other books may chronicle like the historical records of, you know, laws or whatever, of, of dealing with uh, white terrorism or racism and white supremacy. This is like memoirs of mm -hmm. the most despicable, heinous, I mean, demonic type of uh, accounts of, of the sentiments of the people at that time. So I think that's what's different here. We, we're seeing newspaper clippings. We're seeing, you know, it's not just historical accounts of what happens from historians. It's actually from the people themselves who are living and operating at that time. So um, that's why it was a powerful read to me. And uh, let's get into it. Indeed. All right. So <clears throat> being that Josh said that, I'm going to start from this portion of the prologue in the book before I even break down what the bloody shirt is. It says, this is on page nine in the prologue. It says, this book tells the stories of a few of the people who lived through that chapter. It does not prefer to be anything like a complete history of Reconstruction. It does not pretend to explore, much less analyze, all the political and economic nuances that came to bear on the events of this exceedingly complex period in our nation's history. It does aim to challenge the palliative stereotypes, the exculpatory myths, and the outright bald-faced lies that still characterize far too much of what passes for common knowledge of this era. 
era. This book basically is a beginning of deconfederatization. If this was taught in schools, the attack on CRT by the neo-Confederates, today's contemporary Confederates, oh, they would get this book out of their schools in a heartbeat. So let's get into the bloody shirt. What exactly is the bloody shirt? I'm going to read through this. This is kind of a long opening. So I'm going to skip some parts and I'm going to try to read through it so we could get to exactly what the bloody shirt is. It says the title of this book refers to a small footnote to the brutal war of terrorist violence. He uses the proper term terrorist violence. We still are victims of that today. That was waged in the American South in the years immediately following the Civil War. The terror began almost as soon as the Civil War ended in 1865. It lasted until 1876, when the last of the governments of the Southern states freely elected through universal manhood suffrage was toppled in a well-orchestrated campaign of violence, fraud, and intimidation, thereby putting an end to Reconstruction erasing the freedmen's newly won political rights and securing white conservative home rule to the South for a hundred years to come. In some ways, the small incident in question was no different from thousands of others like it that took place in those years. At 10 o'clock on the night of March 9th, 1871, a band of 120 men on horseback, disguised, heavily armed, even their horses cloaked in white sheets, to conceal any identifiable markings surrounded the house of one George R. Ross, deep in the river cut country southeast of the town of Aberdeen in Monroe Ca County, Mississippi. Alan P. Huggins, a Northern man who had settled in Mississippi after the war was staying the night there. And he was awakened by a loud voice calling upon Ross to bring out the man who was in the house. So, um, you know, we could, because I want to get to the part because we got so much, so much to cover, right? Because this guy was. Um... Brother, read all of it, brother. We just read it. To okay. We're going to take, gonna take, right. we, we gonna take <laughs> our time with this one, brother. Read okay, all of no, it. All right. I'm going to read it. Here. Read all of it. All right. Cool. So it says, um, Huggins looked out the window and by the bright moonlight saw the porch crowded with men in white hoods and robes. They told him that unless he came out to receive their quote unquote warning, they would burn the place down. Ross, a good, respectable Democrat. Back then, the Democrats was the fascists. Today, the Republicans are the fascists. Pleaded with Huggins to do as they asked and spared his frightened wife and children. So after securing a promise that, quote, not a hair of your head shall be injured, Huggins agreed to go down to the gate to hear what the men had come to tell him. It was just this. The men whom Huggins would later describe as gentlemanly fellows, men of cultivation, remember that's Huggins' place, well-educated, a much different class of men that I ever supposed I would meet in a Ku Klux gang, did not like his radical ways, they said. As superintendent of schools for the county, Huggins had instituted public schooling, was trying to educate the Negroes, they said. They had stood it just as long as they were going to. Now he had 10 days to leave, leave the county, leave the state altogether or be killed. Huggins replied that he would go when he was good and ready to go. So the men marched him down to the road. And when they reached a small hill a quarter of a mile away, one of them came toward him from where the horses were being held. And in his hand was a stout stirrup leather. That was what they were beating the Haitian immigrants with at the border. And without any further ceremony, he began beating Huggins with the stirrup with all his might. Then the men took turns, each eager to get his licks in. Quote, they said they all wanted to get a chance at me, Huggins recalled afterward, that I was stubborn and just such a man as they liked to pound. Counting aloud each stroke, they stopped after 25 and again asked him if he would leave and again he refused. And so after 50, and so after 75, until he was left senseless, more dead than alive. When he came to, the men trained their pistols on him and repeated their warning. 
that if any of them laid eyes upon him in 10 days' time, he was a dead man. And the sequel was this, or at least this was the story everyone in Monroe County believed. And in time, everyone in Mississippi and the whole South had heard it. Also, that a U.S. Army lieutenant who was stationed nearby recovered the bloody nightshirt that Huggins had worn that night, and he carried it to Washington, D.C., where he presented it to Congressman Benjamin F. Butler. And then a fiery speech on the floor of the United States Congress a few weeks later, in which he denounced Southern outrages and called for a passage of a bill to give the federal government the power to break the Ku Klux terror, Butler had literally waved this blood-stained token of a Northern man suffering at the hands of the Ku Klux. And so was born the memorable, fr memorable phrase, waving the bloody shirt. Waving the bloody shirt, it would, be, it would become the standard retort, the standard expression of dismissive Southern contempt whenever a Northern politician mentioned any of the thousands upon, upon thousands of murders, whippings, mutilations, and rapes that were perpetrated against freed men and freed women and white Republicans in the South in those years. The phrase was used over and over during the Reconstruction era. It was a staple of the furious and sarcastic editorials that filled Southern newspapers in those days of the indignant orations by Southern white po political leaders who protested that no people had suffered more, been humiliated more, been punished more than they had. See, the South was saying that it was they who were being humiliated and punished and, and, and afflicted. The phrase has since entered the American political lexicon as a synonym for any rabble-rousing demagoguery, any below-the-belt appeal aimed at stirring old enmities, enmities, excuse me, that the Southerners who uttered this phrase were so unconcerned about the obvious implications it carried for their own criminality However, seems remarkable for whoever was waving the shirt, there was unavoidably, or so one would think, the matter of just whose blood it was and how it had gotten there. That white Southerners would unabashedly trace the origin of this metaphor to a real incident involving an unprovoked attack of savage barbarity carried out by their own most respectable members of Southern white society makes it all the more astonishing. Most astonishing of all was the fact that the whole business about Alan Huggins' bloody shirt being carried to Washington and waved on the House floor by Benjamin Butler was a fiction. <laughs> they made it up. The, the Southerners made it up. The story about Huggins being whipped by the Ku Klux was true enough. Huggins was whipped on that bright moonlit night so ferociously that he could barely walk for a week or two afterward. So ferociously that in a burning anger that overcame any fear of his own death, he traveled to Washington to testify be before Congress and then returned to Monroe County with a deputy U.S. Marshal's badge and a determination to arrest every man he could lay his hands on who had been a part of the reign of Ku Klux murder and terror in those parts. And Benjamin Butler, quote unquote, Beast Butler, as he was invariably called in the Southern press, the man who had committed the unpardonable insult against Southern womanhood as the Union occupation commander in New Orleans during the war with his order that the next Southern woman who insulted his troops on the streets would be, quote, regarded and held liable to be treated as a woman of the town plying her own avocation. This nemesis of the South, now a Republican congressman from Massachusetts, did indeed make a long impassioned speech about the Ku Klux outrages on the House floor that April and did tell the story of Huggins' brutal beating and the course of it. But nowhere in the Congressional Globe's transcripts of every word that was uttered on the House floor is there any allusion to a bloody shirt. Nowhere in the press accounts of the leading papers of that time is there any mention of a crazed congressman waving a blood-stained garment on the floor or off. Nowhere in any reports of Huggins' appearance before Congress does such a story appear. That part never happened. So, you know, we wanted to read that 
I didn't really want to read it. The brothers urged me to read it, so I did. But it's important that we understand what the bloody shirt is because we see that nah, in yeah. right-wing media today. Anytime one of our people are killed, the first thing that the Republicans do is accuse the Democrats of waving a bloody shirt, although Mike Brown's body was laid out on the floor, or although Trayvon Martin was gunned down by George Zimmerman. So forth and so on and so forth and so on. The victim is accused always of being the one, and the ones that champion the victim are the ones that are being accused of waving the bloody shirt. What, what do you have to say about that, Brother Logic? I mean, the history of the bloody shirt is the origin of all of the political roots that we have to fight today. It, 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 that this, this story, and I, I, I urge the brother to read it all because it is important that you hear it all. For those of you who may have not read the book or whatnot, it's important that you understand this history. And the bloody shirt means every freeman should know about the bloody shirt, right? Every not not just the book, but the political term. The brother told you how it's been added to the political lexicon and how it's been used, right? And so we as freemen must understand and must be very familiar about bloody shirt tactics being used in today's time. There's a lot of bloody shirt tactics that has been used over the time. But and so the, the, the story was important on how the book was even uh, titled Bloody Shirt. So I, I wanted the brother to read all that. So it's important that that we start there. Right. And so this is also before we start cutting deep. I want to read a little excerpt, too. This is follows right after what what he really just read. And this is important for us to understand. Right. So. It says, in 1879, an exhausted Albion Torje, an Ohio-born man who as a state judge in North Carolina had fearlessly defended the rights of the common man, colored and white man, who had defied Ku Klux threats and the sneers of the conservative bar when he impaneled African-Americans on juries and fined lawyers for saying nigger in his courtroom, gave a rueful and weary interview to the New York Tribune. In all except the actual results of the physical struggle, I consider the South to have been the real victors in the war. And he's talking about the Civil War. I am filled with admiration and amazement at the masterly way in which they have brought about these results. The way in which they have neutralized the results of the war and reversed the verdict at Appomattox is the grandest thing in American politics. And as freedmen, you have to know what is the grandest thing in American politics. Now, amazement because such an outcome was not inevitable or foreordained because in the end, Reconstruction did not fail but was overthrown with impunity and audacity in one of the bloodiest, darkest, and still least known chapters of American history. Now, Albion Torje is also the lawyer who represented Plessy in the Plessy versus Ferguson case, which established uh, separate but equal, which was the um, the, uh, the 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 root or the beginnings of Jim Crow or uh, segregation laws. I was to say segregation laws, not going to do Jim Crow. But, so that's a powerful statement by uh, at that time. Uh, he's famous for coming up with the term colorblind justice. And that was uh, Albion Torje. He was also the attorney of Plessy versus Ferguson uh, for uh, Plessy. But that tells you that the grandest political event was how Reconstruction was overthrown. Powerful stuff. That's right. That's right. So I want to, I want to, in the prologue, I want to get to two, there's so many points to hit on. Like I said, tonight we're not going to be able to get through all of them, but we're going to try our best. He notes in the prologue, 
One white South Carolinian of an old aristocratic family uttered the truth in 1877. From the safety of anonymity, the voice in the wilderness spoke plainly. The most horrible tales of Negro murders that have ever appeared in radical sheets at the North would pale before the relation of incidents known to every white man in the South. Let us understand <laughs> what he's saying there, this person speaking in anonymity. Whatever happened to any Negroes up in the North, and there may have been some things that happened, oh, it doesn't compare in any way to what goes on down here in the South. See, the thing is, in the South, it wasn't being reported. This is why reporters like this guy Dennett from the North, which this book is also highlighting, had to come down to the South and get accounts of what was going on down there. It continues. The intimidation of the Negroes is a stern and awful fact. Yet, what do Southerners say about it? It is the bloody shirt. The lying inventions of unscrupulous politicians, the last gasp of carpetbaggery and radical deviltry. So bitterly do Southerners hate to have the truth come out that it is at the risk of his life that any man dares to speak it. When a political crime is committed, they palliate it, smooth over everything, charge the blame on the murdered victims. We are and have been victims of this since press, <laughs> right? T until this day, I brought up Mike Brown. The media, Fox News and everybody else made Mike Brown the victim. George Floyd, Fox News, at one point was trying to make George Floyd the victim. His lawyer tried to make it seem as if he was some drug crazed man that didn't have his senses about him. You mean he was trying to, to they were mm -hmm. trying to make um the guy that shot him a victim. Oh, I mean that that kneeled on his neck is yeah, that's right. That's they tried mean. to make him, excuse me, they tried to make uh Derek Chauvin, Derek Chauvin that, the victim. That's right. It made um what was the officer that killed Mike Brown? They made it seem like he was the victim. He charged right. at me. And then he's Wilson, I think his name was. He said, I seen like right. a demon in his eyes. All of this goes back to Reconstruction time. He says, a bald fact. Generations would hear how the South suffered tyranny under Reconstruction. The South suffered tyranny. Conveniently forgotten was the way that word was universally redefined by white Southerners at the time as a synonym for letting black men vote at all, a remonstrance issued by South Carolina's Democratic Central Committee in 1868, personally signed by the leading native white political figures of the state, declared that there was no greater outrage, no greater despotism than the provision for universal male suffrage just enacted in the state's new constitution. There was but one possible consequence, a superior, quote, a superior race is put under the rule of an inferior race. See, we had the numbers then. And we're going to get into a little bit of that later. We're going to get into that. They offered a stark warning, quote, we do not mean to threaten resistance by arms, but the white people of our state will never quietly submit to Negro rule. This is a duty we owe to the proud Caucasian race whose sovereignty on earth God has ordained. So these people believe themselves to be the sovereigns, the white folk, especially in the South, over the whole of the earth, according That's to right. their Christian God. That's right. And, and you know that that goes back into them papal bulls and, That's right. and all that stuff. Ahead, That's right. And, and we're going to get into that. We're going to get into that one day. We, we're going to have a real in-depth comment. Matter of fact, I think one of our book club books is going to be a book called White Too Long. That, that's going to come in the, in, the, in the very near future because we need to address that again. Okay, so it, it, it says, no free people ever declared a speaker at a convention of the state's white establishment a few, few years later have been subjected to the domination of their own slaves. And the applause was thunderous. 
This is a white man's government, was the phrase echoed over and over in the prints of the democratic press and the orations of politicians denouncing the tyranny to which the quote unquote oppressed South was being subjected. A bald fact, and I'm gonna come back to that point. A bald fact, more than 3,000 freedmen, listen up family, this is important. More than 3,000 freedmen and their white Republican allies were murdered in the campaign of terrorist violence that overthrew the only representatively elected, excuse me, yeah, elected government the Southern states would know for a hundred years to come. This is why we say that many of these governments in the South are illegitimate. They spring forth from illegitimate elections based Fact. off of the overthrow of Reconstruction. But I want to go back to a point, and I want us to touch on this real quick. Says, this is a white man's government. Was the phrase echoed over and over in the prints of the Democratic press and in the orations of politicians denouncing the tyranny to which the oppressed self was being subjected. Now, we hear many so-called black power, RBG, anti-Americanist detractors say, what y'all voting for anyway? Y'all stupid. This is a white man's government. You ain't going to never get anything in this white man's government. What they do not realize, and that's the one thing that I've realized from reading this book, is that much of the things that black people say today was started by all the racist white supremacists that never wanted freedmen to have any power. And so white supremacy took on a new role in our minds. We became the purveyors of this sentiment. We became its spreaders. Well, what do right. you have to say? To, yeah, bros, what do you have to say to that? A whole lot to say about that, right? And that's why a full scale deconfederatization has to happen in your mind first. You don't even know your psychology is saturated with. Confederate ideas and ideology. You don't even understand the negative thinking. Malcolm X gave a speech one time. Bro, y'all y'all remember that speech? Malcolm, he started out was like, who taught you to hate yourself? That's right. He was like, who told you your black skin wasn't ugly? And who did this and who did that? Right. Yeah, right? He was talking about this very same history right here. It's the Confederate way of thinking. You understand? This is what the Confederates taught in the education system. This is what the Confederates taught Right in the, uh, the 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 health system in the medical field that these are beasts and well, this is all rooted in confederacy. If you don't have a proper identification of your enemy in your true opposition, where it lies at in thought and practice, you can never truly be successful in defeating, overcoming, or surviving your enemy. You understand? And so, a lot of us are promoting confederate ideology, and you don't even know it. You don't even know it. And you're the enemy to the cause of the freedmen, and you don't even know it. You don't even know that you're a freedman. You don't because that was how important it was to destroy that connection. They was like, damn, they can't figure out. We're gonna get more into it. And even a, 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 another read, right? If you read from here to equality by Dr. Sandy Darity and Kirsten Mullen, they talk about the freedmen in 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 a chapter like that. that's called the seven mystic years. Yes. Oh, yes. And in those seven mystic years, they talk about the amazing progress that the free the moves, the strategic, the political genius of the freedmen and how we were able to do things that you haven't seen really done yet. That that type of American uh, reform, constitutional reform, that type of change hasn't happened since then. You know what I mean? The only thing that can compare to that is like uh the the new deal or not not even that but like it, it, there's really nothing that can compare to it so that's right brother we Ali. talk about so uh, no, 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 one, one, one more thing so when we talk about civil rights justice work right the beginnings of civil rights justice work is starts with the freedmen 
the, this this book covers it expertly and, and it has a really good timeline, right? Right after the Civil War. You you know we get to 1866 Civil Rights Act, but before that you have the Freedmen Act in 1865, right? It's called the Freedmen, Refugees, and Abandoned Lands Act, right, of, of 1865. And it really spells out a lot of the prescriptions that were needed and are still needed, in my opinion, for to, to repair the damage that had been done. Right. And so the freedmen, as wise as they were, they're the ones who met with General Sherman and came up with the plan for special field order 15. It was freedmen justice work. That's what we have to be rooted in today. If we want to have some of that, if we want to taste just a little bit of that type of success politically in our pursuit for power and in, in our pursuit for uh, the real the right to really access uh, Americanism and, and full citizenship. We have to get back into Freedman work. And I think the launching pad is the bloody shirt. Yes, indeed. Brother Ali, what, is, what are your thoughts on that, man? These terms that have carried over from Reconstruction that our people who are supposed to be conscious, right? The awakened crowd that, that they're still using until this day. I think you guys have already hit it right on the head, you know, um, the, the confederatization of the United States and its and its citizens is not just one that took place amongst the white population. It's something that the, even the black population have fallen subject to. Right. So, you know, you continuously get people who will espouse a lot of these talking points. And unfortunately, oftentimes it, it's our own people. You know, I posted something on Twitter just as an example. I posted something on Twitter about Abraham Lincoln. It was a statement that Abraham Lincoln made about the fact that the United States could not have won the war if it were not for the involvement of the freedmen, the black freedmen, Negro freedmen. And that was a direct quote, right, Ali? It was a, that's a direct quote. Freedmen, that's a direct quote. he said. He said freedmen. Now... What's interesting about it is, even though he said that, there's a person who I believe is a black person. I, I, I believe is a black person. It, it's possible he's not. Came on and immediately started to talk about how Abraham Lincoln didn't care about black people. Abraham Lincoln used <laughs> black people for his purposes and then threw them away. Abraham Lincoln wanted to send black people over into Africa. He he was a he was a he was a fan of you know expatriating black people from the United States and sending them wherever you know all of these different things. But a lot and a lot of times what it what it winds up being is a situation where these people want to be so smart and, they, and and that they miss very simple points. The simple point was what the man said in the comment. The United States could not have won that war without the assistance of the freedmen. So the point is, if it was not for the freedmen, there would be no United States right now. That's all. That's all. Very, very simple. Very simple. Indeed. I, I, Josh is a, is a little in and out. So, Josh, I don't know if you're able to jump on right now, but if you are, you know, you could share your thoughts. If not, I'm going to move on. All right. So this is what I'm going to do. I want to get to his acknowledgement parts before I move on. And we're going to get to this Freeman part and because we want to stress why this term Freedman is important and how it is providence, truly providence that in today's days and times when the political theater is at its height among the citizenry here, due in large part to two enigmatic and polarizing figures in Barack Obama and Donald J. Trump that we, the descendants of freedmen, today's freedmen, have resurrected in its ideology, in its namesake, in its pursuit, and in its fight. So let me let me read this. He says, I would like to thank, in particular, the staffs of the South Carolina Library, the South Carolina Department of Ar Archives and History, the Mississippi Department of Archives and History, the Sophia Smith Collection at Smith College, 
the Duke University Special Collections Library, the National Archives, the University of Virginia Special Collections Library, and the South Carolina State Library. Why did I feel it important to read where this man got his sources from in this book? Because it's our history. See, we came up in these different schools of thought. And I give honor. I give honor to all my past teachers. I just want to say that. I give honor to them because I wouldn't be here right now. Even though we disagreed and critiqued them on this platform, I still give honors to them because you should always honor your teachers. If they taught you one thing that you were able to elevate yourself with or your knowledge, et cetera, et cetera, then I believe, in my opinion, that they're worthy of honor. But we, as Moors, we look in Morocco, right? If we in he Hebrew Israelites, we're trying to find ourselves in the biblical lands of, of ancient Israel. Uh, you know, the Pan-Africanists are strictly looking into Pan-African, you know, the, the West Africa, excuse me, while being Egyptians, when Egyptians and West Africans, and from my studies, didn't share anything, weren't even a, a melu of uh, ideologies, religions, et cetera, et cetera, right? But our records, I just read them. They're of, of this tribe, the Freedman tribe, is right here. And that's where he pulled them from in this book has articles cut directly from these sources, directly from the archives that I just read from. So I, I wanted to stress that part because there's, our history is deep. There's a parade ceremony in this book that the Freedmen did. I'm not going to read it on page 18. I was yeah. just thinking about that. You pulled it straight out of my mind. <laughs> As soon as you said that, that's exactly what I was thinking about. I'm like, not going to read is, it. We might do no, a part two tomorrow, but but let them know the significant this parade. This parade was, your was first Memorial Day parade. That's right. This America. was the first Memorial Day parade where they laid wreaths at the dead. We did that. The Freedmen did that. Something that is copied today. We don't even honor that. See, black people celebrate Memorial Day and they don't even know why. This is why this Freedman history has to be elevated again. We need to understand the significance of it. Why, did, why do New Yorkers celebrate, black Freedmen New Yorkers celebrate the 4th of July differently than the, the rest of the Freedmen? Well, that's because the Freedmen in, in New York were, well, the, the formerly enslaved were freed on, on July 4th. I can't remember the date. So for them, the celebration is an extra special one. So if you grew up in New York, like myself and Ali did, then you know how lit, to use a, a modern terminology, it is in New York City on the 4th of July in many of our neighborhoods. So um, Brother Ali has something that he wants to pull up. So we, we're going to read that because it's, it's powerful and it deals with the Freeman Festival. Yeah, go ahead, Brother Ali. All right. So this is something that I shared earlier today. It's called the Freedmen's Festival, right? And it was an annual early fall celebration held by Cleveland Blacks to celebrate the Emancipation Proclamation and acknowledge the struggle to end slavery in the United States. This particular festival began in 1863. Frederick Douglass was the celebration's first speaker, and he set the tone for future events, paying tribute to the valiant deeds of Blacks in arms in the Civil War and praying for the souls of the dead. So I just wanted to share that just to show you that this whole concept of recognizing yourself uh, under this particular name, Freedman, is not new. This is this is something that they were doing in 1863 with this thing called the Freedmen's Festival out in Cleveland, Ohio. So I'm going to stop sharing that book so we can go back into the book. Now, and that's excellent history. We are, this is not us trying to indoctrinate anybody. Indoctrination would be 
coming through various different schools of thought, we know what doctrination is. We're not, I'm not going to get into no breakdown, but I'll, this is just who we are. And we've gotten away from that. And I'm going to get into that right now. So there was a letter written in Charleston, South Carolina by some freedmen, you know, um, I'm, I'm not going to read it for the sake of time, but they were basically saying that we would like our rights to vote. We are free men now. And this body should not deny or reject us this right. The author says this. They might have been calling across a sea for all their voices were heard. It is understood, reported the Charleston Daily Carrier, a few days later, and one could almost hear the sniff, quote, that a number of Negroes in Charleston City have prepared a memorial which they have requested to be presented to the convention by a delegate from that place. I'm, I'm not a, I might, time permit, and I might go back and read that ceremony that we did. It was powerful, and I think we need to recreate that every year, man. I, I really do. It says, we trust for future safety and welfare of the state that the document will not be placed on the records of the proceedings. It cannot be but the earnest desire of all members that the matter be ignored in toto during the session. Hmm. The next day, the convention voted that the petition from the colored citizens of Charleston be, quote, laid on the table without being read. Sounds familiar, right? Sounds like the ignoring of any legislation, any policy that has to do directly with freedmen. Today, we just have it at the federal government level. The George Floyd Justice and Police Act, Policing Act still hasn't been signed, while the Asian right. American Pacific Islanders and everybody else, they bringing Afghans over here, and Biden just signed, what was it, three point something billion, or I don't even right. remember the number. And okay. I don't think that that George Floyd Justice and Policing Act is even going to get passed, and it should because it it actually addressed a number of things that needed to be addressed in uh, as as it pertains to um, judiciary practices in the United States. But then I don't think they're going to pass it. Last thing I read about it. But go ahead, bro. Yeah, you know we're still going through these things. Okay, so this is my stress point right here. So I'm gonna get to it. And we're going to build on it. And then we could, you know, we're going to build a little bit. We about an hour into the string. I knew we was. I got like a thousand points. <laughs> Yo, we, we, we got to get in as much of it as we can. We're going to get it in. We're going to definitely get it in. We're going to definitely get it in. Okay, so it says it was cozy, comfortable club. It was a cozy, comfortable club of familiars who met in Columbia. The delegates to the convention included 12 men who had served as delegates to South Carolina's secession convention in 1860, i.e., e.g., Confederates. Among them were the secession convention's president and the man who had introduced, introduced the motion for secession, several ex-Confederate generals, an ex-Confederate senator, and South Carolina's first Confederate governor were present too. These were rebels against the United States. These were criminals that committed sedition against this great country of ours. And yet, here they are in South Carolina's house, seated and ignoring the petitions of our freedmen ancestors. So was the state's provisional governor, Benjamin. F. Perry, if you've been a follower of the Be The Power platform, you've heard Brother Logic bring up provisional Governor Perry all the time, read from this same book whenever we needed to stress on certain points. But let us get in depth here. Let's get a little in depth here. Benjamin F. Perry, he was a pre-war unionist who had opposed secession for fear it would endanger slavery. But then he rallied to the Confederate cause and served in South Carolina's Confederate legislature. Le legislature. So really, he wasn't opposed to secession. He just didn't want slavery to end. And in his opinion, well, secession might be bad for slavery. It continues. 
expecting stern terms from the federal government. Perry had been pleasantly surprised when President Johnson, and y'all know who President Johnson is, right? Andrew Johnson, the worst president in American history, not Donald Trump, not Donald Trump, Andrew Johnson. It says, Perry had been pleasantly surprised when President Johnson gave him the appointment as provisional governor and made clear he intended to leave the job of organizing the new state governments entirely in the hands of what white Southerners like to call, quote unquote, the natural ruling element of their society. <laughs> the president asked Perry to just write occasionally and let him know how things was, quote unquote, getting on and reconstructing the state. So the federal government passed the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to reconstruct this government so that it could be favorable to our freedmen ancestry so that they could become whole citizens here. This devil, Andrew Johnson, put a pro-slavery person in charge of the state and said, you reconstruct it the way you see fit. And, oh, provisional Governor Perry did just that. It says, the new governor's first official act was to issue a, a proclamation reappointing all Confederate officials to the positions they had held in the state government at the time of the surrender. So he put criminals in office, lawbreakers, seditionists, traitors. And, his op and Andrew Johnson, the president, didn't have a problem with that. In his opening address to the convention, Perry made quick work of the freedmen. How the Hebrews say? Re read that again. I <laughs> In the opening address to the convention, Perry made quick work of the freedmen. Yeah, this the, is an important piece you read in here. Yeah, the quick work of the freedmen. Quick work of the freedmen. It was the delegates' unavoidable duty, he instructed them, however painful it may be, to adopt a declaration affirming that slavery will never again exist within the borders of the state. Like, oh, okay, provisional Governor Perry. <laughs> yeah, right. African slavery, which was a cherished institution of South Carolina from our earliest colonial history, he said, is gone, dead forever abolished by the war-making powers of the United States military authorities. It was likely that three quarters of the state would soon ratify the 13th Amendment, that they did, thereby making abolition the supreme law of the land. So they recognized the 13th Amendment. Facts. It was a necessary condition for South Carolina's readmission to the Union that their state include a like declaration in the new state's constitution. Somebody missed that one. If you followed the schools of thought that we come through, Ali, all of us on Be the Power, Noble Drew Ali said the 14th and 15th Amendments brought the Southerners back in union with the South. But he forgot the 13th Amendment, and we know that it was the 13th Amendment because provisional Governor Perry is giving us a uh, testimony to that fact. He said, let me, let's read it again. It was a necessary condition for South Carolina's readmission to the Union that their state include a declaration in their state's new constitution. Speaking of the abolition of slavery and having some uh, language similar to the 13th Amendment. Peep what Provisional Perry says. Until this is done, until this is done, we shall be kept under military rule. See, they couldn't really yeah, do man. what they wanted to do under yeah. military rule. Let me start over. Until this is done, we shall be kept under military rule and the Negroes will be protected as quote-unquote freedmen by the whole military force of the United States. Come on, Talk bro. to him, family. Come let's, on. Let's, yeah. Let's, let's, let's talk yeah. about it. Let's talk Come about on. it. And, and like, this is what, 
<laughs> you can't <laughs> get you can't get around the Friedman identity. Let me say before y'all go in. Let me say before y'all go in. I want y'all to touch on this thing. This is saying that so long as we number one don't conform to the federal right. government's law. Because he right. states that the 13th Amendment is the supreme law of the land. Mm -hmm. That the Negroes then will be protected. Mm -hmm. He puts freedmen in quotation in the language. marks. He there. puts it in quotation marks <laughs> by the whole military force of the United States. Matter of fact, let me read this part. I want y'all to I want then y'all go. I want y'all to go in after that. It says, yes. but to be no longer a slave in no way make the Negro a citizen, Perry hastened to add. The radicals in the North who were already saying that there should be no distinction between voters on account of color, forget that this is a white man's government intended for white man only, Perry said. To speak of extending political equality to the Negro was nothing but folly and madness. A few months later, it had become folly, injustice, and madness. The African has been in all ages a savage or a slave, Perry declared. This is why we are going to give honor to Noble Drew Ali for bringing that Moorish history. Because that portion of it showed us that that's a goddamn lie. God created him inferior to the white man in form, color, and intellect. And no legislation or culture can make him his equal. You might as well expect to make the fox the equal of the lion in courage and strength or the ass the equal of the horse in symmetry and fleetness. His color is black, his head is covered with wool. Instead of hair, his form and features will not compete with the Caucasian race. And it is in vain to think of elevating him to the dignity of the white man. God has created a difference between the two races and nothing can make him equal. There are so many lies that were told so many lies that were told in, in, in Provisional Perry and the Southern thinking. But I want my brothers to go back real quick to this piece where it says, and the Negro will be protected as freedmen. Because how I read this book, and I asked Josh, I don't, yeah, we were all on the phone. I asked Josh about two weeks ago to keyword how many times the word freedman was in the book. And he said about 72 times or something like that. It was in the 70s. Then I asked him the key word, how many times the word Negro was in the book. And it was over a hundred and something times the word Negro was used in the book. See, the book starts off freedmen heavy. But more and more, as the Confederates, the rebels, the traitors to this country start to take over, more and more, the term Negro simply replaces the term freedmen. You couldn't legis you couldn't really do what you wanted to do against freedmen. You couldn't necessarily make laws against the freedmen because the federal government, according to what provisional governor Perry said, wouldn't respect it and would look at, at look at it as a breach of contract, if you will, a breach of the compact when you ratified the Thirteenth Amendment. Well, what are y'all thoughts on that? I'll leave. Oh, oh, oh Logic, go ahead, Logic. No, I mean. I mean, you just you just said it. The progression of erasing what is actually impactful and significant to your power base. You you can't if if see people think that it just was a happenstance that this history specifically was erased. That Reconstruction isn't taught in school. That's by a, a concentrated effort because we will. There is a special history in that hidden history. Abba read something, right, from provisional Governor Perry. And so some people say, well, that was just Governor Perry. He didn't speak for the people of South Carolina. And they'll try to sanitize the whole thing on them. If you don't know this history that we're talking about and why it's important that it's buried. Check this out. This is how the citizens, right, came and, 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 and doubled down on what provisional Governor Perry said, because the people of South Carolina said, nope, we, they could have said, we don't want no more civil war. We're not with none of that. We accept the new deal in America and yada, 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 provisional Governor Perry's 
doesn't represent what we're talking about. He went rogue. They could have done that. But this, and this is why the bloody shirt is so important because, it, yes, the the bloody shirt is a second, it's, it's a secondary source, but it's filled with primary sources from that time, from that era. You understand? It's filled with primary sources. This primary source was taken out of a pamphlet called The War Still Exists. You understand? It says, the respectful reminiscence on behalf of the white people of South Carolina against the constitution of the late convention of that state now submitted to Congress for ratification, right? This is reconstruction history. So you bring up reconstruction, you got to talk about stuff like this, right? And it says that constitution was the work of Northern adventurers, Southern renegades and ignorant Negroes. Not one percentium of the white population of the state approves it. And not two percentium of the Negroes who voted for its adoption know any more than a dog, horse, or cat what his act of voting implied. The Constitution enfranchises every male Negro over the age of 21, the Negro being in a large numerical majority as compared with the whites. The uh, effect is that the new constitution establishes in this state Negro supremacy. I want to pause right there. This is what everything is rooted in. This right here, the fear of this right here is what everything is rooted in and what our ancestors understood at that time and what our enemies understood. I'm reading again, it said the Negro being in a large numerical majority as compared with the whites, the effect is that the new constitution establishes in this state Negro supremacy. That right there, family, is the reason why South Carolina was the first state to start passing what we know as black codes, the public subjugation of our people. Right. You understand? We're going to get further. But but this right here, when you talk about specific civil rights justice work you talk about reparations and you don't get into this history and you don't have this evidence like this is our claim the people specifically from south carolina this is the the, the citizens bucking the system and they're talking about the freedmen let me continue yes it says a superior it, it, uh, it, it says with all its train of countless evils this is how they're speaking about our ancestors a superior race of portion senators and representatives of the same proud race to which it is your pride to belong they're trying to call on the appeal of all their white uh family members you see uh, uh it says is but is put under the rule of an inferior race the abject slaves of yesterday the flushed freedmen of today you understand there's a connection between slavery and freedmen. They're talking about our specific history, our specific lineage. And, they're, and your enemy is talking about it in a primary source document. It says, right, the abject slaves of yesterday, the flushed freedmen of today. And think you there can be any just lasting reconstruction. Excuse me. And think. You there can be any just lasting reconstruction on this basis. We do not mean to threaten resistance by arms. They didn't want to do another civil war. They didn't want to go to war again. But what they did say is, but the white man of our state will never quietly submit to the Negro. We may have to pass under the yoke you have authorized, but we will keep up this, con this contest until we have regained the heritage of political control handed down to us by an honored ancestry. This is a duty we owe to the land that is ours, to the graves that it contains, and to the race of which you and we are alike members, the proud Caucasian race, whose sovereignty on earth God has ordained. This is on the public record, family. This is on the public record. This is congressional archive, state archive. This is evidence. So we don't have to go up and just, just do a bunch of, this is evidence. We submit this. This is what they did to our specific people. And then when you have people who want to come in and shoehorn their way into our justice claim, that's why we have documents like this. This the, You weren't a part of this. This is the origin story. We're talking about the origin story, right? 
And if you don't have this history that's in this bloody shirt, you're going to have a lot of uh, blanks to fill in. I'm just telling you, the bloody shirt fills in them blanks. But did you, did you see how the citizens came back and doubled down on Governor Perry's uh, white supremacy? Everybody wants to fight white supremacy. And like like you pointed out the other day, Abba, we were talking about the uh, on the uh, Donda album, how uh, my man um, Jay Electronica <laughs> had a dope verse. It was a dope verse. It was, it was a dope a, it was a Probably the hardest verse. verse on the album. Probably one of the Possibly. hardest verses I heard in, in a long time. But uh -huh. then you 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 brought something that was so man, it made me look at that whole shit like damn. He was like he was talking about what hurricane, like what, what happened in Rwanda and what he happened. He said in um Haiti. earthquakes will strike this nation. Mm -hmm. Earthquake earthquakes will strike this nation for what Bush did to Rwanda, what the mm -hmm. Clintons did to Haiti, mm -hmm. what Downing Street did to Ghana. And mm -hmm. then you know, I was saying, what about earthquakes striking this nation for what Bush did to New Orleans? What the Confederates did to our people in the That's South. That's right. And the That's things right. that we're still suffering from until this day. We're so that? disconnected from our freedmen history. Man, it's so much stuff in this book, man, that hit so <laughs> hard. It's, I mean, we've been talking. <laughs> y'all know I've just been hitting y'all up. We're getting on the conversation just pissed off, man. When you, <laughs> we, we, we ain't really ain't even got into nothing yet. I, I don't know if y'all mad already. We really haven't even got into anything in this Word. book. If you if you if you upset right now, <laughs> no, wait wait till we really get, get into, into the upsetting stuff. Yeah, we yeah just <laughs> break it. we still kind of scratching the surface a little bit. So yeah. you know that's why I said we might do a part two tomorrow night as well because you know there's so much to discuss with this book. I mean, this book alone can be the basis of. 10 other books in depth, in depth. So brother Ali, what was your, your take mm -hmm. on the, um, the, the Freedman portion of that? You know, I want to hear your take on that where provisional governor Perry's like, so long as they're protected as quote unquote free, I mean, they will be protected as quote unquote Freedman if we don't do this. Right. Well, basically, I mean, he's just admitting that um, they were under military rule and that they had to either um, they had to either submit to the changes that were being required by the federal government or continue to have that military rule there in the South. Right. And force those changes to be made, right? Actually, they forced it regardless. How, however you look at it, it was a forced change that the whole reconstruction of the state constitutions, et cetera. Um, and so in their minds, and, you know, we talked about this, Josh, the compromise of 1877, which ultimately came um, where the federal government abandons the freedmen, uh, Basically, that's what they were looking for. You know, at the end of the day, they were looking for the federal government to get up out of the South so that they can continue doing what it is that they were doing as he was speaking about their God given uh, right to dominate uh, people of African ancestry, et cetera. That's what he that's what they wanted to do. So whether that be by, you know, uh, Jim Crow laws, et cetera, they wanted to get back into that. The racial terrorism all of these different things that's what they wanted so in order to get back into that they had to agree to the uh, adoption and ratification of this 13th amendment to get those guys up out of the south you know ultimately and that's what happened so that's all i see it as yeah it's essentially what is what he's saying is you know and, and there's a let me just just take off for a little bit right so there was a piece that came out um i think there was a united nations hearing and um the yep. united, it was on reparations and race and things like mm -hmm. that and, I, and there was several countries that uh skipped out on that hearing they they were active for other hearings u.n hearings but that part when they had to talk about race and reparations mm -hmm. oh the united states they didn't want any parts of that right now yeah. it made me think about it like Really, what does the U? What kind of power does the UN have to to inflict over the United States to make the U.S. do anything? Nothing. Absolutely That's why nothing. it doesn't matter what kind of declarations or resolutions or whatever they come out with. You can't make the United States enforce them because you know why? The United States of America is 
all, it is like a United Nations because uh, like all of these different states, the way that they constitution uh, operates, they, they right. almost, you know, can uh, operate uh, as, as nations independently. Mm. And so what these Southerners were looking for was a way so they can operate, go back to operating their independent nations, just however they see fit and justice. They can they can implement it at their whim to whoever they want. They wanted the power to have their nations back, you know. And or have their states back Facts. because that mm -hmm. and 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 as long as the uh, federal government who, who they got their behind whoop by right the freedmen, the freedmen like you said Lincoln said we uh, the Union would not have won that war without the freedmen. they could not have won it without the freedmen. That's right. Um, they would not they would not be able to have their state back without uh, 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 adhering to. The, what all the other states are agreeing to, which is that 13th Amendment. You got to put that up in your state constitution, you know, or else you, you we're going to keep these troops here. Um, yeah, man, it's it's a, it's really interesting when you look at what was going on as far as those states. And um, it, it wasn't just South Carolina. Obviously, we know, you know, we, in this book, it goes in on Mississippi. Um, yeah, man, it's Louisiana. just. Oh, and, and they highlight South Carolina so much because <laughs> South Carolina led the charge. South Carolina yes. was leading the charge. And there's so much and, South Carolinian history that we don't even know about. And like it, it, it's, it's really made me feel a, some type of way because I'm like all of the stuff that I'm learning about South Carolina, every freedman should have a special place in their heart for the state of South Carolina. So many of our heroes were homegrown there so much of our history is is housed there so much freedman history comes from that great state south carolina that is the mecca of freedmen family south carolina is the mecca of freedmen with, with mississippi running a close second right but i want the blood <laughs> shirt is such an important book right because let me um read two things two quick pieces because the bloody shirt is a tale of terrors but it also talks about some amazing miraculous like almost supernatural accomplishments that we that the freedmen we the freedmen achieved during those same times and so it's going to start with something gloomy and, and dark and then it's going to talk to you about 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 the beauty and the the, the miraculousness of what our people can build in a literal hell not a mythical or a fictitious hell now 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 listen right it says it is almost a daily occurrence this is, let me just frame it real quick. This is an interview that's being conducted, right? In real time, in, I think it's uh, 1865, right? It says, it is almost a daily occurrence for black men to be hunted down with dogs and shot like wild beasts. A freedman from Edgefield told a government agent in the autumn of 1865, the colored people called them bushwhackers. And then when I read when I read that, I said, well, damn, when I was a kid, there used to be a wrestling uh, yeah. tag team duo <laughs> called the Bushwhackers. And yeah, I like Butch this motherfucker. And, 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 and yeah. Harry or something like that. Yeah. What was and, it? I, and I'm up here I and I'm like, hell yeah, I'm rooting and supporting the, the goddamn Bushwhackers, <laughs> man. It's, it's, and then it's like I'm reading for, this. Um, Starsky the and Ku Klux Klan. Yeah. It's, right, it's yeah. Like or, or, the, or the good old boys. The, the, the Dukes of boys. Hazard. The Dukes the of Dukes Hazard. Of Hazard. Right. The, Dukes like, damn, right? Hazard, the Dukes of Hazard. The Dukes of Hazard. God damn, that's just powerful. And so it said the color people call call them bushwhackers. An army, uh, an army board of inquiry sent to examine the situation uh, amply confirmed the tales. So they sent like they they just thought this was you know these Jimmies out of their mind. They talking about bushwhackers killing folks. They sent an army inquiry, and like the brothers were talking about, military dis military districts controlled the South at this time. So the army was in charge of everything. So the army would have to come in, conduct interviews, do an inquiry, send that shit up to, you know, Washington to see what you, what, what we need to do about it. War secretary, you know, all these different generals, what are we going to do about it? So they, it was a legitimate inquiry done and it confirmed what the freedmen were saying. We called them bushwhackers. They just whipping and killing uh, our brothers and sisters at will, right? Confirmed by the army, right? It said a band of a hundred men led by a former Confederate officer, marauded at will through Edgefield County, whipping or killing Negroes who dared to leave the employ of their former masters. This is a story no one can hijack. You understand? This is our story, right? 
And but 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 see, at the same time that's happening, look at our people. Look, look at our what they say. Look at God. Check this out. But in Hamburg, oh, ha, but Hamburg offered the freedmen a strengthening numbers. It tells you again where our strength is at. And so you can see why uh, 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 the uh, brothers at BTP support the return home strategy, the reverse migration strategy, right? Because there's strength in numbers. What did it say? What did our ancestors have said? But Hamburg offered the freedmen a strength in numbers and a safety in remoteness. Hamburg was a haven, at least a relative haven, a haven by comparison. Within a few years, the town was home to hundreds of colored families who had broken free of their of the life of contracted farm workers, a life scarcely distinguishable from slavery itself. Among their numbers were school teachers, railroad employees, blacksmiths, a successful cotton broker, a printer, a clerk of the court, shoemakers, painters, carpenters, and constables. They, they, they bought lots and furnished homes. There were several who made considerable investments in farms and other real estate in South Carolina and in states beyond. You understand? So even in the same time that they're hunting down and killing us and in the face of some of the most uh, heinous crimes and, and murder sprees, our people are still finding a way to make a way out of no way. And that is the Freedman way. What's the Freedman right. way? Making a way out of no way. Making and we're creating we havens in hell. Hey, we need t-shirts yeah. made up like that, Laundry. <laughs> yeah, we do. We, we, we're making havens out of hell. You, you, know, you right. see what I'm saying? Who else can do that? You have to be a miraculous people to make a haven in a hell where they're just running around killing you up and we're still able to become carpenters and blacksmiths and constables and shit like that. That got to be a powerful people. Yeah, 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 who can do something like that? I, there ain't another people that I've read about in history, and I like history a little bit. And I read, I read quite a bit. I ain't never heard of a people who could create conditions like havens in hell and hell and things of that nature. You know what That's I'm saying? Right. But the freedmen, only the freedmen can do that. That's right. Hey, bro, brother, uh, logic. Just to build on the point you're making about that, the power of that um, freedmen majority, that freedmen power of numbers. Let me yeah. read a little excerpt. Um, it's, this one is from, uh, I don't know what the, I, I'm, I got it on, on um, Kindle. So it's page 1044 in Kindle. Um, this says, the pamphlet is called The Respectful Re uh, Remonstrance. And it says, the white people of South Carolina <laughs> against the constitution <laughs> of the late convention that of, of that state now submitted to Congress for ratification. <laughs> nobody from nobody from the South get get offended at my at my imitation of the of these um racists from back in the day, right? All right. So it's this. the chapter. I know which chapter you are. I just can't. Go yeah, ahead, it, go it's ahead, chapter bro. eight. Chapter eight. Chapter, okay. Okay. Yes, yeah, says that Constitution was the work of Northern adventurers, Southern renegades, and ignorant Negroes. Not yeah, one I read that. percent. Oh damn. <laughs> no, keep going. I want to hear your okay. version. That sounds really well, good. Your, your version is more entertaining. <laughs> yeah, that's better than my version. <laughs> Come on. Josh no. Friedman. Well, while he's coming back. <laughs> Yo, and, and see, so at, right after they talked about that haven out of hell we made, they talked, and this is why the bloody shirt is another beautiful masterpiece, because it teaches you, a, and, and, and it's a must for all freedmen, right? <clears throat> if you want to be a, a student, a, an adept freedman, you have to have it, because it talks to you about heroes that I personally never knew about before I read this book. So right after that, it talks about, it says, hey, guess what? If Prince Rivers was not yet South Carolina's king, how many South Carolinians I got in the house tonight? If you're from South Carolina or you got family in South Carolina, let me know something in the chat. Talk to me in the well, chat. One, one and, right and ask here, me. South Carolina go back on both sides of my family. Both. And of I, I want to know, have you ever heard of Prince Rivers? And is Prince Rivers a household name in South Carolina? And is, he being, is his history taught in South Carolina? And it's very important that I ask this, right? Because check this out, right? If Prince Rivers was not yet South Carolina's king, as his uh, colonel had once predicted, he might someday be. You got a, a, a Anglo-Saxon colonel in the army predicting that this freedman, Prince Rivers, 
could one day be the king of South Carolina, the king of South Carolina, not the governor. They had governors at those at that time. Not none of that. He said this man could be the king of South Carolina. That's a powerful man. And if you don't know about him, we need to we need to we have to be loud about this man and who he is and what he's done. Right. And it says he was Hamburg's prince. When colored men received the right to vote for delegates to the new constitutional conventions that Congress had ordered the southern states to convene, Rivers was selected as the register of voters. I'm going to pause That's right, right there. How right. much have he harped on this program about the importance of being a reg uh, 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 not only a registered voter, but having the power to register voters? We what, talk what, what's that official title? A register agent, right? A, a voter no, the, register um, agent. What was the other one? Um, oh, we talked about precinct committee. Right? Precinct committee, man. That's right. Yeah, but there's a lot of like, but 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 what we're talking about is the power to to register people to vote. You understand? That goes back all the way to Prince Rivers. Of That's Freeman, right. That's right? right. And it says Rivers was selected as a register of voters and then elected as a delegate. Damn. But, but as elected as a delegate, right? This is in like 1865. 1866, right? It says he hand. It says the same year of miracles, 1868. He was uh, uh, elected to the state legislature and became a trial justice or magistrate for Hamburg. He uh, handled the routine matters of small crime and small claims, writing his orders in a smooth, flowing hand. Now we're talking about. The first magistrate in South Carolina as of a freedman descent of a freedman origin, and we don't. This is not taught in school. This is not taught in the history books. That in 1868 they want to talk about all these other little things with the first this and the first that and the first that and Kamala Harris and all this shit, but they don't teach you <laughs> about the first magistrate and the first voter reg right. register agent right there in South Carolina That's in right. Prince Rivers. Come on now, family. This is our history. Now, when I read that, I was blown away. I was like, "Well, man, there's so bro, much." I history thought, of, I thought Rivers right history. of you, bro, because you, <laughs> you know, been on the platform pushing that the precinct committee men. That portion of the book, I was like, "Damn, this is what we've been stressing." On top of stressing the importance of knowing about our freedman ancestor from South Carolina, Prince Rivers, whom. As you were reading, I think it was his colonel that said mm -hmm. if, if South Carolina would ever have a monarch, he would be it. He was so impressed by this man. So he said that he was, I mean, I could read the quote directly. I don't, I God would have to go to the page. <laughs> but, you know, he said that the way he was in, in, in physique, et cetera, was better than any of his white soldiers. And, and while we're talking about heroes. Because y'all hear us speak about John Brown all the time on this platform. We call him the greatest white man to ever step foot in, in these here United States of America, right? But I got to, because of this book, give a shout out to three people in particular. The fourth one, I don't know if I want to give him. It's a less honorable mention, but I'll, I'll say his name. The first one. Adelbert Ames, who was a general, a senator, and the provisional governor of Mississippi. Albert T. Morgan and Lewis Merrill, all white men. These men, I don't know how it was before they, what, what their frame of thinking was before they got to the South. But once in the South, these people did everything in their power to make sure that the freedmen got their rights respected. They tried to arrest all of these Ku Klux Klansmen. They tried to bring them to justice. I mean, at, at the expense of their own lives and at risk of, of their families getting violated by these devils. And we, I mean, there's after reading this book, there's just no other I can't think of a, another word that defines them better. I, I just can't. They were devils. These men 
Adelbert Ames, Albert T. Morgan, and Lewis Merrill, they deserve honorable mentions from us freedmen. A less honorable mention is the, a man by the name of James Longstreet. He fought with the traitorous General Lee, but he, he then switched sides. And after he switched sides, you know, he just wanted to come the country to heal. And, oh, man, the press did a job on him. They made him the devil. This book is, it, it just highlights what the press did in those days and how right-wing media operates today. Now, I want to, um, and after this, you know, because we, we, it's just so much, it's so much to cover, man. But I want to read this one letter from, who is this guy, man? Uh, what is his name? Oh, Edmund, Edmund Rhett. And then I want to read a response by, um, by Ames, who was the major general commanding mili of the commanding military district in Western <clears throat> South Carolina at that time. So I hope I, because I said provisional governor of Mississippi, I hope I didn't mix him up with somebody else. But anyway, let's, let's get into this real quick so we could kind of move on in the time. First, this is in closure. First, and this is by this guy, Edmund Rett. This was done Aiken in Aiken, South Carolina, October 14th, 1865. This is page 23, y'all. I'm forgetting to read the pages. Somebody in the chat reminded me by saying, what page is that? <laughs> so thank you. In closure, first, listen up, family. An act prohibiting all freedmen. Hold on, hold on. An act prohibiting all freedmen or persons of African descent made free by act of the convention in September last from ever holding or owning real estate in South Carolina or their posterity after them. Look at the, the name that they use, an act prohibiting all freedmen. An act of this sort is essential in order to uproot the idea, which has now run the Negroes crazy all over this state, namely that they are all to have 40 acre lots of their own. Let the idea of their ever owning land pervade amongst them and they will never work for the white man or upon any land but their own. Let me pause here. That's powerful. That's powerful because when we speak about having access to capital so that we could take our place in the affairs of men in this nation, which largely has to do with ownership, we understand the sentiment and where it comes from. That's why this book, The Bloody Shirt, is so important, and we urge you all to read it. Get it, read it, study it. It is important. It says, the act is essential because it will at once cut off all competition between the white and the black man. The black man must then forever labor upon the capital of the white man. And the white so hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay. Right there, they're specifically like this is you have to look at this stuff as evidence, family. We're building mm -hmm. a civil rights justice claim, right? This is evidence. We're reading evidence live on the air. This is these are primary source reference documents that he's reading from. This is this is the culpable party admitting their criminal actions, <laughs> right? right. right. You, you understand? That's and so right. you have to, as a freedman interested in justice uh, uh hell bent on reparations right you must know these things you have to know your history go ahead brother it says the black man must then forever labor upon the capital of the white man and the white man must take care of him or else he will soon have no labor people just don't understand that ideas have a have a lineage as well and this idea has pervaded up until our times. I regard it as the most vital law that can be made for our future prospering. Y'all see us here on Be The Power pull up an article that shows that the U.S. economy lost $16 trillion due to racial discrimination, racial discrimination 
between the years of 2001 and the time that that article was printed in, I believe it was 2020. This was going on back then. It's going on now. It's rooted it's in the psyche of white supremacy to keep us locked out, to keep us <clears throat> boxed out, to ever, to keep us from ever being owners. Byron Allen is a billionaire and he's still having a problem with ownership. He has to go all the way back to contracts, I mean, to uh, acts from 1866 about mm -hmm. contracting just so that he could have his fair share in this country. <clears throat> wow. Companies here elevate every other group. It is a battle against the freedmen. And this is why this name is so important. And we must take it. We must take it. It's out. like, like the, the descendants of those who were enslaved by the five slaveholding tribes have sense enough to do. They still maintain the name Freedman, whether that's Cherokee Freedman, right. whether that's Choctaw Freedman, etc. And what happened recently? You just had a free an American Freedman and by the name of Maxine Waters advocating on behalf <laughs> right. of those Indian that's Freedmen. Right. That's you right. see what I'm saying? So so mm, they mm. are wise enough, they're <laughs> wise enough to preserve the Freedman name. It's just the American Freedman having a problem with it. They want to latch on to other contrivances and things of that nature, these these made up names, when the fact of the matter is the history that you're reading, brother, is all built around those people who were acknowledged by this government and everybody else as freed people at that particular point in time. That's right. So that's right. That's and right. We can and get, we can get, we can get we could go. That's gonna. That's gonna be another program. That's a whole yeah. other program. That is, yeah, we we gonna, was going in on that again. earlier. But let me say one more thing, right? The two hundred thousand freedmen, uh, uh, you cut out again, out. Josh. But in the in, in addition to what uh, Ali was saying, right? <clears throat> that uh. Not only do they have sense enough to use the name, right, the, the, the power in the history of Freedmen, is that uh, when you when you talk about the Freedmen, this is telling you everything that your 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 like the policies that you read were specific. So when you want to go and undo specific policies. You got to be as specific as those original policies were that fucked you up in the first place, right? And so without the Freedman identifier, you're going to be missing the mark. You're going to be hitting around it, but you're never going to be really getting at it. You, you, you're never, never being on target with it. You understand? So you're, you're, you're saying, okay, you're identifying certain circumstances like slavery. And you want to connect yourself to the circumstances. And you want to connect yourself to the, the, the atrocities. And all those are good moves. But the best move is in, in the pursuit of specificity is to connect yourself to the people, to the identity that experienced all those other things. And that's what Friedman does. That's how your enemy identifies you. That's how your, 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 your friends, your, your, your uh, allies identified you. Right. And that's how we uh, identified ourselves. And it was a powerful thing. And Byron Allen had to go all the way back into Friedman policy, Friedman policy Talk to help to him. him. And today Talk he, to could, him. He, he had to go back over 100 years. Right. <laughs> to a policy produced by the early free, the first Friedman. You understand the first Freeman. He had to go all the way back to that. And that created his strongest arm. He still, you know, it, it went the way it went or whatnot. You can't really call that a, a win or a loss. I mean, I, I guess That's it's right. a win-win for him, right? They have that That's term right. business, a win-win, right? But ultimately it kind of chipped away at the Civil Rights Act itself. But but what it did was it produced the strongest argument in the and it built him the biggest hopes and to to be successful. And go all the way back opened, there. Let me let me say this too. It opened us up. To look at those reconstruction amendments. That's right. It did. Yes. Yes, it did. And 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 that and what and it, it was a really good moment because it told us uh we me and the brothers picked up on it immediately. It said this is what we have to do to solve our problems. We have to go back to the the uh the most successful 
people or, or the people who had gained the most success in the most difficult times. So in a time where people are being outright killed with reckless abandon and you're still able to create what this book call it havens and hell, those are the people who are best at it. And so we, we want to go to the best references. The best reference for civil rights justice work is the Friedman references. You got to go into them Friedman archives. And that's how you get yourself schooled up and get yourself squared away on what you need to be doing today. Because these are the fulfillments of the Friedman that everyone's trying to do and they don't even know it. And you won't even honor them. You won't even honor them. You want to call yourself everything but a Friedman. You don't. You, you want to call yourself the institution's name. You want to call yourself uh, 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 every uh, negative word in the book, but you don't want to call yourself uh, uh, the hero's name, which is the Friedman. That's right. You understand? Prince Rivers was That's a Friedman. Right. You know what I'm saying? Freedman. Hiram Rebels was a freedman. You understand? Freedman. Robert Smalls that, that, was a freedman. Oh, you understand? That man right there. Come on. These, these that, men look at these brothers. Andrew. Look at those men were freedmen. Frederick Douglass. I'm trying to get y'all to see him. <laughs> Frederick Douglass is the godfather of the freedmen. <laughs> the do, you, do you understand? Do you understand how powerful the Frederick Douglass? He's a superhero. This man beat his goddamn slave master's ass <laughs> and didn't die. Talk to him, bro. Talk you understand? To him. What man can do that? He whooped his slave master. <laughs> You understand? Then when they and went to head to leave, you know, with Harry or with all of Harriet Tubman's success and all of John Brown's success, what person binds them two people together? Frederick Douglass, the king of the freedmen. He is the emperor of the freedmen. You understand? You have to get into Frederick Douglass. People talk about Marcus Garvey. And we did a program on Marcus Garvey and how he was ultimately the messiah of missing drift. You understand? Because that wasn't what Frederick Douglass was trying to accomplish in America for the freedmen. You understand? Frederick Douglass was opposed to the colonization of, of the freedmen people in Africa. That's right. That was against Frederick Douglass' philosophy. That's right. So how you got somebody come a, a couple decades after Frederick Douglass talking about, let's go back to Africa. You've mission, that's mission drift. You have fallen off the freedmen path. You've deviated greatly and dangerously. And we must understand that because now we don't even know that. And we look at these people as, as the, as the, uh, foundation layers for what we need to be doing to achieve justice in America. You see how nefarious this all has been? The people who really laid the foundation like Frederick Douglass and Prince Rivers and Hiram, you don't even talk about them. All these afro pan-African uh, uh, scholars and influencers and shit, they don't <laughs> tell you about Prince Rivers. He, Prince Rivers That's was right. a, a goddamn mayor and a magistrate one of in them. South Carolina. Not one of Not them ever, one ever of told them you about Prince Rivers. Have, no right. one has ever gone on and on and on like they we do had to about get it. Hey, uh, logic. We had to get huh? it from a man named Stephen Budiansky. Budiansky. <laughs> Budiansky. <laughs> some some immigrant motherfucker had to come tell us and, this shit. You know what's crazy, bro? Um, <laughs> the history of our of our people being involved in politics and the political sphere of the of their day goes all the way back to colonial America. And that's that's the, the the shame of it all is that nobody teaches any any of our people that man. It's just kind of like you you got to find this stuff out on your own. It's and it's so unfortunate. There was a a brother that I I came across through researching uh, where he was a um, he was a part of the Maryland legislature legislative body in the 1600s. 1600s man like 1630 something or something like that you know what i mean and this is a brother who was a, of african ancestry so it, it's just unfortunate that you know this particular information about our folks don't um don't get taught doesn't get taught the way that it should i think what you should do bro is read that second piece where oh, he's yeah. talking about a stringent act against vacancy. I think you should read that. That's yeah, important. let's, Ooh, let's yeah, get yeah, yeah. But hold on, hold on, hold on. But let me let me make this comment before you go do that, right? Mm -hmm. Because I, I want to, uh, in addition to what Ali just said, why they don't teach you about the Freeman history, because they don't want to teach you about uh, uh, Jimmy's and niggas who was so uppity and had the audacity to whoop their own slave master's ass, like Frederick Douglass, the Emperor Freeman. They don't want to teach you about Robert Smalls, who who had the 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 wits, the cunning, the ability. Uh, the, the audacity and the courage to 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 revolt on here on a Confederate ship, kill all the people on, kill all the killed all the Confederates. They can't teach you about a, a man and, and getting the Jimmys riled up to kill their masters and take over Confederate ships. Then had the the wits, he memorized all the hand signals 
that the Confederates was using so he could safely use those signals to have safe passage across dangerous territory, enemy waters, made it to the Union side, delivered the boat to the Union officers. And the Union officers, they said, that's a bad man. He, We can't do no shit like that. Let's make him the captain. And they made Robert Smalls the captain of the ship. Robert Smalls fights in the war as the captain, whoops all kind of Confederate ass. He gets out of the Army, right, and goes back, gets his money, and buys the same damn plantation he was born and raised on. They can't teach y'all about that. That's Friedman power. That's Friedman history. That is a goddamn a uh, 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 magician. He's a wizard. That man's a superhero. <laughs> that He's man's a superhero, you, family. Born as a slave, hero. killed the slave masters, took the ship, came the captain of the ship, went back, raged war against the slave masters, killed them up, and then went home and purchased the very land that he was enslaved on? Come on That's now, right. family. That's the story That's you right. got to know. You gotta know that. You gotta know it. So let's. I'm gonna read these next pieces <clears throat> and then because it's so much i mean i got so many notes i can literally come on for the next several nights and still not have exhausted <laughs> everything that i've jotted no hold on one more second i don't mean to interrupt you i know we running short on time but somebody gonna come in this friedman chat and say i'm going with marcus garvey well get the hell on with him then marcus garvey ain't <laughs> never killed up no white folks in america and took no that's goddamn right. ships and liberated no motherfucking body. that's right marcus garvey ain't ain't wasn't the first uh person he wasn't in no uh, military raids he talked a lot of talk and, and, and I'm not going to uh, hold back on old Marcus uh, Messiah Garvey, the Messiah of Miss and Drift. I ain't going to hold back on him because I'm a free man. You understand? <laughs> and and, and he, he ain't kill up nobody like uh, Prince Rivers did. I mean, and like uh, Prince Rivers fought in the Civil War. Marcus Garvey ain't fighting no goddamn Civil War. He ain't do what uh, 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 Robert Smalls did, kill up no uh, slavers and and, and liber liberate no people and buy up no slave lands. Marcus Garvey ain't do no shit like that. So you take your ass on with Marcus Garvey. I'm staying with Robert Smalls. I'm staying right. with Prince Rivers. I'm that's staying right. with uh, Harriet Tubman and Frederick and Douglass. These men you, behind that's what you me. need Hiram to do. Rebels, Blanche, yeah, Hiram Rebels. Yeah, Hiram Rebels. That's, that's what, what we you need stand to do. Go on with him. You, go on, you get on that boat. You get on the Black Star Line. Okay, <laughs> Act 2. A stringent act against vagrancy on the part of the freedmen of African descent. It's that freedmen language. A law requiring each Negro in each district to have a recorded domicile, which it shall be unlawful for him to leave without due notice given to some appointed magistrate. If you grew up in New York City, in the housing projects like I did, they created these laws. You could be just come outside, chill in front of the building that you live in, and you would get a ticket for trespassing. Like, we lived this stuff in our time, family. From then to now, they found a way to make this stuff legislation, to make it law, let me say. Or without 12 months' notice of the fact and the place to which he intends to move or some other restriction as to the method of his movement. It's like, damn, that's like being on parole. <laughs> From slavery to parole. Also requiring him to show that he is in the lawful employ of some white man. Damn. For the violation of such restrictions as these or such other restrictions as may be deemed expedient, let the vagrant Negro be taken up and put to hard labor upon public works and chain gangs, such as the repairing and building high roads and the paving and cleaning of streets. They, they do that today. In New York, I did that. They they call it they call it community service. They call this community service. Be they sure found do, a bro. way to took all of take to take all of these Confederate proposals and make them law some way. This is why we have to become politicians. This is why we have to become the power. It says for not less than sixty days at one time, and then be returned to his locality. Yeah, come do some slave labor for us for sixty days. We'll find a way to rotate you Negroes out 60 days at a time, basically. The object of this law would be to give fixedness. Well, I don't think I even heard that word before. Fixedness to this population and to prevent their internal, excuse me, eternal wanderings and floating about the state from one point to another. Lazy, lawless, 
thieving, and vanguardizing. Third, an act to enforce the fulfillment of contracts between the employer and the employee of freedom, an act by which the Negro will be held both as a vagrant and a criminal should he leave the service of his employer until the term of the contract is fulfilled, by which he may be seized and put to hard labor, i.e. slavery, for vagrancy and two, also be made to pay the planner the value of his wages for the time of his contract yet not yet expired. They did this during the times when our people were indentured servants. After a while, this was some of the tactics that these plantation owners, the bourgeoisie, bourgeoisie would start to employ on our people. It says the law should be as stringent as words can make it to force the Negro to work and as a penal and as penal as humanity would permit. Act four, an act to regulate discipline. It is essential that there should be some system of discipline on larger plantations, both under the apprentice system and under the coolie system. Some corporal punishment as found necessary on the part of the employer. Imagine going to work and your employer could whip you for being late today. Like you're late, go in there and strip plumb naked and hold on to that pole so I can whip you 30 lashes. This is what they were doing back in the days, family. This is what they wanted, and this is what they were trying to do. It says, it strikes me that considering the prejudice prevalent against the prejudice prevalent against whipping, the Negro should be put on the footing of an enlisted soldier. That only such a punishment as is customary in the army towards white men should be allowed towards the Negro by the employer. That the employer should have the same power given to him as is given by the Articles of War to the commander of a garrison exclusive of the court-martial. These powers it would be safe to give, and some, underlined, must be given. Now, I'm not going to read the rest of these. Y'all hear how crazy these laws are, but I want to just get to this part, and then I'm going to let the brothers come in. We have somebody that wants to challenge the name of Friedman as well. So, you know, we'll we'll entertain this person for, for a few minutes, but we're going to get through some things first. So um, the, the man that we gave props to, Albert Ames, he wrote a letter. And this time he was the uh, commanding, he was the general commanding of the commanding military district in Western South Carolina. I'm trying to read because it's like in shorthand, so... I don't know if I'm saying it correctly. BVT, Major General Commanding Military District, Western South Carolina. So uh, let me skip. Let me skip to this part. He says, my reports are to the condition of the freed people contain all I would. My reports as to the condition. I'm kind of hype, y'all. So excuse me. I'm, I'm jumbling my words up a little bit. <laughs> My reports as to the condition of the freed people contain all I would say in the subject. The outrages upon them, which have been reported, speak more effectually than anything else possibly can. As with my soldiers who have been killed and wounded, no effort is made by citizens to protect the freedmen or punish those who trespass, trespass upon his rights or assist us in punishing them. The condition of the freedman is simply this. So long as he is subordinate after the manner of a slave and not a freedman, so this language is important, and does as well as he is safe from violence. But when he attempts to depart from his old discipline and assert a single privilege, he meets opposition and in localities is punished with death. This results from the fact that many, especially the ignorant, can see in the Negro only the slave. It is my opinion that the time has not yet arrived when the northern man can live in the western parts of this state in security should the troops be withdrawn. And remember, those troops were withdrawn in 1877 after the compromise between, uh, who was that, Tilden and Hayes, I believe it was. Even though yes, 
U.S. forces are here, it will be seen by the action of the people of Edgefield that a northern man cannot live there. From various sources, I have gathered facts which force me to the conclusion that my command is the most turbulent and disloyal of any east of the Mississippi River. One of the things that this book highlights is that they were calling for the suspension of the writ of habeas corpus because these criminals, these criminals in the South, the Ku Klux, the White League, etc., who made a pact with hell and a covenant with death, Look that term up because this is the exact pact that they made to oppress our people. The writ of these people like General Ames wanted the writ of habeas corpus suspended. Those of us who came up in the Moorish movement, for instance, started, most of us, in sovereign citizen, some form of Moorish sovereign citizen. Facts. Facts. And one of the things that they railed against in sovereign citizen isms are direct progeny of the ideological thinking of the Southern Confederates. It's a fact. Habeas corpus. They railed against the suspension of habeas corpus. It was a part of their conspiracy theories. It was a part of the paperwork. I know I broke day reading this stuff thinking I had stumbled across some new information. The whole time, I was merely reading, accepting, and indoctrinating myself with the anti-federalist doctrine that we find at the beginning of this nation who didn't want the federal government to have power because they wanted full control in these states. Period. Period. So, bros, did y'all want to speak to anything? It's, I mean, like I said, there's so much stuff that we can get to. What do y'all want to speak to? And then after y'all, I'm, I'm going to get to this. After y'all speak to that, I want to make another point that I've read on Be the Power on several occasions out of this same book. To go with what I mentioned earlier about us accepting and adopting white supremacist talking points as our own. Yeah, well, you mentioned Ames, right? And mm -hmm. we can't talk about Ames until we, unless we also mention uh, the good Captain Morgan. Yeah, I, I know a lot of y'all been drinking Captain Morgan whiskey and I mean, or spice <laughs> rum, and you, you don't even know the significance of Captain Morgan in your own Freedman history. Let me just read something from Captain Morgan, right? It's, Captain Morgan is in, is in Mississippi, right? This is Mississippi history, right? It's really important to that. This is a, a quote that Captain Morgan ha, has said, right? And he's, he's talking about our political fight for governor and things and reconstruction, right? And Mississippi says, yes, they still faced opposition. But even that was an inspiration only to fight harder, to fix their goal more truly, to work, work, work. That was the Freedman. That's what we did. He's talking, he's marveling at what we're doing in this time, so after the Civil War, right? He said, the storm clouds only remaining as the glass through which we are enabled to see without being blinded. It had been a mistake. He felt ever that now he's talking about these enemies, these Confederates that are still here today. He said, it had been a mistake, he felt, ever to try to con con cons consolate their opponents, even attempt to and even a, every attempt at appeasement had been taken as a confession of weakness. Nothing should have been granted to the rebels until they voluntarily embrace all of the conditions of pardon. Have they done that, this even yet in Mississippi? See, so what Captain Morgan is saying is that Andrew Hughes, what he's really doing is critiquing the president at this time. He was like, why in the hell is Andrew Johnson giving pardons to these people when they have not even executed all of the uh, uh, conditions of the pardon of their Facts. surrender at Appomattox? That's right. Not even Mississippi has done this That's yet. Right. And you're already issuing pardons. This is the criminal operation we're talking about. It only becomes evident in Freedman history. Now, it's, this is his other quote. He said, when I reflect that the hardships and losses we have sustained during and since the war, 
because we were Republicans, how we have been ostracized, insulted, mobbed, and outraged by the men and uh, sur the men who surrendered to us at Appomattox. Listen to what he's saying. He said they have been ostracized, insulted, mobbed, and outraged by the men who surrendered, the losers, to us at Appomattox and swore fealty to our government only to show us subsequently how that oath was only meant by them to be a means of their release that they might be free to exhibit their hatred contempt and independence not only for the people who had who had conquered but for the government that have pardoned them he said, these people are not the type of people you can negotiate with. He said, man, we done pardon these folks and everything. And all they talking about is destroying us. You know, he's like, man, we made what he's witnessing. When, what he's coming to the self-realization of is we made a major mistake on how we've handled these people. He's he's major seeing what Albi, he's seeing what Albion Torje was talking about in the beginning. What we read earlier on how we really lost. The political fight here. He's like, what's going on? We did this is a captain in the army. He was there in the battles. He's like, we whooped these people. What's going on? Why are they gaining so much power? And they lost. He doesn't even, he can't even understand it. And he's living in 1865. You understand? And so now with that, we have to get into this history and understand what happened so that we can get it right. And you you can't be afraid of this freedom history. You have to know it because it's your history. It's your great grandparents' history. We're not Step that far it, removed baby. from it. We're That's not right. that far removed from it. Like I said, and we, we said on Clubhouse and we talked about it before, me and Abba and Ali and Emma, we're, we're only right, right, second generation Northerners. You That's understand? Right. My grandparents is from the South, from Georgia and Mississippi yeah. and Tennessee. Like, like I'm, you talk about first and second gen immigrants. Well, hell, you are first and second generation uh, refugees kid in the North because that's what that was. The Great Migration was a uh, 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 popularized as a, a, a move for betterment in life, but what it was is a flee from domestic terrorism and state oppression. We didn't want to leave the South. Our people stayed. Nobody wanted to give up those numerical political majorities that we could dominate these. But we did not have the support. We had the federal government helping our enemy come back mm. and destroy and and and, and take. Mm. Uh, we went from he helped the South turn us, deliver us from we we fought the war to end private bondage but the federal government helped the states transform us from private bondage to public subjugation That's you understand right. so now that we and like it says in dr darity's book we ceased being the property and uh, of one individual white person and became the property of all white people everywhere. He didn't have to pay for you know, just because you was mm. under the black codes, you belonged to him. You had to listen to him. You right. had to you had to do what he told you to, or he could just say anything right. and you'd be hung, lynched, killed, and jailed in prison. And the black codes right. are an unconstitutional thing, family. Don't Facts. you understand how powerful our reparations claim is when you understand that everything happened was unconstitutional? And that it was That's a right. violation of the reconstruction conditions in the first place. And that the uh, 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 the mistake president and that Andrew Johnson was never supposed to be president anyway, but he became president out of uh, assassination of the uh, legitimate president. So Andrew Johnson mm. was a drunk fool who was weak and was able to be manipulated, didn't have the courage to take the nation where it was already going. And he ended up just delivering the country into the hands of the criminals. You have to know that. Only Freedman history teaches you that. You can't learn That's that right. nowhere else. That's right. Brother Ali. Peace. Yeah. So, I mean, listen, I think that, you know, we, we covered a lot here. And I know there's a whole lot that cannot be covered. And, and you know, it, I think you said you had one more excerpt. Is that what you Yeah, well, I'm, I'm going to read one more excerpt and then we're going to bring on a guest. <laughs> that wants to debate us on on the term freedman so let's let's get to the um <laughs> i'm gonna get to the uh excerpt this is in chapter five um man let, let, let's let's bring them on quickly if we can they're pressed for time let's let we need he, yeah, he we want will, us to get to will. work <laughs> uh chapter this is page 35 so we're gonna read uh we're gonna read from several pieces in let me see 
from from chapter five, right? I thought the South wanted it to end there. So let me see. Uh, okay. From every white Southerner he talked to, the journalist, he's talking about Dennett, heard the same opinion. The Negroes were doomed to extinction. They, these people really believed that we couldn't live without them as if we didn't live for thousands of years before they first showed up on the planet, built some of the greatest civilizations man has ever known. But anyway, that's here and there. Planters and yeomen, secessionists and unionists, wealthy and poor, all agreed on that much. Ah. The white loungers, and, and we're still here today, family. We are still here. The white loungers in every city hotel didn't note it. The loiterers at the depot, the idlers who gathered at every country store or tavern, chewed their tobacco, struck a leisurely pose, sipped their apple brandy, peered out at the muddy road and declared that the Negro was lazy, indolent, ill-adapted for freedom, sure to die out. <laughs> you know, he, he writes that article facetiously, like, well, I mean, that, excuse me, that portion of that chapter facetiously. These people were the ones that was hanging out on the corners doing nothing, calling the Negroes lazy, indolent, ill-adapted for freedom and sure to die out. Now today, they feel like they are the ones that are, that are about to die out. It's so funny how, how things work in this country. In his weekly letters to the nation, Dennett nearly always refrained, this is chapter, page 35, y'all, always refrained from offering comments or opinions. But this contradiction irked him. Quote, in the country parts of Virginia, I have seen at one time and another hundreds of white men, he observed, and I doubt if I have seen in all more than 10 men engaged in labor of any sort. So what they were accusing us of is what they were doing, being lazy, basically. A traveling companion he met on the railway going up the line for a load of timber allowed that his company, quote, can't get enough white men, even though he was paying hands $18 a month plus board, $50 for trained carpenters. Quote, they're too damn proud to work. Rather loaf around Richmond and Petersburg. Let me tell y'all real quick. My last job, I was there for well, hey, three hey, years. Hey, shout out to uh, Richmond Petersburg, 804. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. Hey, one more, one more thing real quick. Man, we all, you could tell we, we all, we vibing. We all on the same page because Every every part that you got highlighted and y'all been reading, man, I got every single other part. So like, yo, I'm, That's right. I'm trying to find a place to come in at every time. Like, yes, yeah, my turn. Damn, he just took my, you know what I mean? No doubt. Because no I doubt. just had it in my notes. I was like, they said that the Freedman was lazy. We didn't want to work. They oh, was the one lazy and the Freedman right. was working. But go ahead. That's right. So I was at, at this job for about three years. And I kid you not, there were there was a, a the uh, maintenance guys, all white, one black guy, one freedman, let me say, one freedman. All the rest of the maintenance guys were <laughs> Confederates. And I mean that, they were Confederates. Where they, their work was easy because they only got called to fix the machines, which means that if there was nothing wrong with the machine, during a 12-hour shift, these guys did nothing at all but sat in the shop where the maintenance guys sat, where the hard work, the real work was being done at. Not one white person ever stayed. Not, well, at least the men. Not one of them. Not one of them. Every, especially on my shift, they all quit after a while. They all quit. So when I read this, Line. They're too damn proud to work. Rather loaf around Richmond and Petersburg. They tried to flip that on us. It says, and then most of the whites admitted that the Negroes in their neighborhood were doing tolerably well, performing all the manual farm labor that needed doing. Then it looked at the list of destitute rations, yada, yada, yada. 
So, you know, but, but still the Negroes were sure to die out from a combination of their own laziness, even though they just admitted that we were doing well, and the government's refusal to allow them employers to punish them for it. <laughs> okay, so he goes to this farm. He starts talking to this man called Mr. W. <clears throat> he says this. He said he had ever once to give an order to whip a single one of his niggers. I believe you never did, Colonel. I wish still to treat my people in the same way. He said, I never whipped them. I just want them to be my slaves. The owner continued, but they are fast making it imp impossible for me to do so. There are always some bad men in every hundred, and now the bad niggers spoil the rest. <laughs> the free ones, he means, that don't want to be slaves no more. Since mine were freed, mine, they have become lazy, stubborn, and impudent. Really, lazy because they don't want to slave labor for you no more? For free? They know that they have escaped from all government. Yeah. That we cannot chastise them. And they are not like white people. I begin to believe they are without gratitude. Oh, they should have <laughs> had gratuity for being enslaved to this kind, honorable Southern man, I guess. Mine appear to have forgotten all the kindness and leniency with which they have been treated by me and my family. Interesting. He went on some time in this vein, complaining with a special bitterness that, quote, the government has taken away all the coercive power from us. A Negro does what he likes, and I cannot inflict adequate punishment. This is one of the reasons why they, they were always anti-federalists, and it had to do with slavery. But after the 18, after the passage of the 13th Amendment, oh, it kicked up 10 times more than what was going on with the Jeffersonians, et cetera. It continues. How much does he pay his pe how much does he pay his people? The colonel was asked. Listen to what this man says, y'all. And I want y'all to think about reparations. Shout out Sister Shanna Kim for becoming a new member. And shout out to all members of Be The Power. Make sure y'all hit that like button. Support the platform. Cash app, dollar sign, Be The Power. You can use the super chat. We have links to our PayPal in the description. Also, you can uh, support via our 501c3, the United Sons and Daughters of Freedmen at USADOF.org. It says, he was asked, how much does he pay the people? The colonel was asked. Listen to this, family. No money wages. If you give money to a nigger, I got to do my Josh, he goes and spends it for whiskey. And if I, he said, and I have no intention of making the country any more unsafe to live in than it is at present. Besides, sir, and Mr. W will tell you the same, they are not worth it. A white man will do the work of three niggers and one slave did more than three of these freedmen. Well, of course they did. Of course. <laughs> they were course. forced to do that. But I want to highlight this point. How much does he pay people? The colonel was asked. No money wages. If you give money to a nigger, he goes and spends it for whiskey. And I have no intention for making the country any more safe to live in than it is at present. Now, who made the country unsafe? The white folks did. And that's a fact. And this book highlights that. That's number one. Number two, a trope. A trope. Yes. That if black people get reparations, we're going to buy it on. Mm -hmm. Cadillacs, Jordans. 20, two inch rims, and endless supplies of Air Jordans and hair weaves, gold chains, and hair weaves, and all types of frivolous things that black. This is the origin money. story of those tropes. This is These the origin are, story of those the tropes. Origin story. The yes. Origin story of and coming from the memoirs. The memoirs of white supremacy. <laughs> yeah. These are the, the memoirs. memoirs. Of white supremacy, the memory. So, 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 so Naheem, what's up? I know you're going in. <laughs> no, no, I feel you. What's up? Y'all uh, ready? ready? Yeah, man. Okay, let's bring Please. our guest on. <laughs> oh man, he says, he says he doesn't want to debate. 
He simply wants to educate us. Well, I mean, it's it's funny because mm -hmm. when we were going back and forth, he said he wanted that he he was willing to debate, but oh, but okay, so okay, so he, let's he he wants to show us that he's a master teacher. So let's let's okay, let's, let's okay. Master 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 teacher. you you're on you're on. All welcome right, to be the power. Y'all got my wife about to kill me. No, we don't. But you know, we have to no, do no, our that, show, brother. But go ahead. Speech. This, this, this is all I wanted to bring to your attention. I wanted to ask you guys, um, who, who, who gave the pass for slavery? As you guys are speaking now, we're going to. Excuse gonna... me, I'm, I'm sorry. A ask the question again. I, I don't understand it. Who, who is the one who legislated slavery? What, what do you mean by that? We, we, hold on, hold on, hold on. Clear with your question. Slavery. Can I say this? Slavery. One second, slavery. Brother Joshua Hinton, Hinton right? You yes, said sir. you was going to come no, on I'm and a, educate. I'm a bay. I'm, I'm a bay. What a bay. Whatever, 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 right? You said he you just, were going to educate. Don't come on. Give your education. That's Show it. your knowledge and your understanding. Right, Don't start go. asking okay. a bunch of questions. That, if you're going to try to teach, start teaching. Don't ask no questions. Start teaching. All right, unmute yourself, Joshua. Right, I I, 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 the whatever, whatever. We don't have to talk to each other like that because I'm moving everywhere. I gotta be in the territory of Delaware for the people in Delaware, and I provided everything for the people there. So all I demand, brother, are you gonna start the to provide the education that we need on this subject? I. I uh, yes, but if I'm telling okay, you my name go. and for a man to say whatever, whatever, that's not that's not respect. Because it's irrelevant if you have a bay on your name or not. That's not relevant, brother. If you're calling my name, it's relevant, right? Well, if we would have called nah, Joshua, just, just all on, I did on, was call on, your me. name, how it presents itself how on it's the screen. Presented if you wanted me to call screen. you bay, you should have put it on the screen. That's now, right. Come on and stop wasting time. So all yeah, I did was inform time, you I was a bay. Okay, that's all. I'm not trying to be. I'm not trying. Y'all guys are being real confused, and I'm not trying to be. I was trying to ask you something so because confused. you're reading okay. the memoirs, and I'm trying to explain where it came from. First oh. of all, the Black Christian Codes of 724. Are we familiar about the Black Christian Codes of 724? What does that have to do with this topic tonight? This is what legislated slavery. Are the you aware? So the wait a minute. Hold on. Hold on. Let me. 724. Yes. <laughs> Hold on. Yes. The so year 724, saying, not 17. So saying, okay, 1724. Oh, 1724. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead, brother. Okay. So, this so, is what so, legislated uh, uh, slavery. This was about nations in a trade, right? Now, all I said to the brother, I didn't say that, that our people weren't freemans. They were Freemans, but I'm telling you, they were only free. You gonna pull it up, because, Ali? Pull it up, yeah, Ali. We gonna uh, pull it up on screen because well, I see. It. Hopefully, he ain't deleted. Man. I hope you ain't deleted, brother. Delete I hope you ain't now. a dishonest broker. Oh no, I'm gonna explain what I said. I didn't okay. say they weren't Freemans because I knew. I said they freed freedmen. Not true. Freedmen. Freedmen. The last. Yeah, we're name. talking about freedmen with a right. D. So the last That's name Freedman. I was saying that they were never freedmen's before colonization. That's all I stated. How That's is a, that relevant? I just want to... Nobody's talking about nobody's last name. I don't understand how this is right. germane to anything. That's right. That's well, what I'm is, saying. But how is, is what you're saying that relevant? We had. So if that's not what it's about, then me and you were having a misunderstanding. No, that's all I was telling you. <laughs> that that wasn't listen, hold, listen. On, Ali. hold on, I'm trying to get to it right now. I'm all trying right, to get to ahead, it, bro. I'm trying to get to it because let yeah, me, let me somebody please you. frame this because it, it, I'm going to tell you what happened. Crazy. Right, I'm he says he me. said he said, said that we go ahead. go ahead. He said we're not freedmen. This is what he says. Hold Meaning on, our on, last name. That's and and I told you, you that, and I told you that no one was talking about anybody's last name. That's what I said. You stated that in the chat. Hold on, because we were talking about this in the chat, and all I stated was you. All I stated was like, hey, you know, I know that we were freemen, and and when it came to the colonization, freedmen, but we were also no stop. What colonization? Colonization in America stopped in seventeen seventy six. That's right. 
It stopped in 1776. Are you familiar with the Revolutionary War? Yes, I'm familiar with the Revolutionary War. What was that war about? The Revolutionary War? It it was about... uh, The Revolutionary War was about control of the trade. On their part, not our part. All right, so it's on the screen. (laughs) Go ahead. He posted... this, This was about... Let me let me show you this that's with. He posted something about France took the United States to court using the treaties Morocco made with the United States. Who thinks this is of importance needs to study. We're using the Constitution while others are using our treaty, right? 1950 this is a case fact. concerning the rights of case concerning rights of nationals of the United States in the country of Morocco. This is what they're talking about, the rights that US citizens have in Morocco because of the United States consular jurisdiction at the time. 1952, okay. keep this in mind, right? Because he thinks that we don't understand this stuff. And I tried to tell this brother that we have been dealing with this stuff for years, for years. years. I told him, You don't know we come out the Moorish movement. When brother Sharif, <laughs> not come on, man. So anyway, movement. I said, it's not something I said, it's not something that France can do nowadays. And why was it that in 1952, France was able to use the Moroccan American Treaty from the 17 or 1800s in the first place? That's the question that you should be asking, especially since you all think that your leader at the time that the prophet was around was somebody called a sultan in Morocco. That's a problem. See, you don't even nobody really said understand. that. He never. You don't even he, really wait, understand wait, wait, wait. why France. He never. On, let me finish what I'm saying. He said France was. He said he says the leader, our leader in Morocco, the title of our leader in Morocco is Sultan. That's what, That's he, said. what he said. That's the title of the ruler in Morocco. And I'm saying to you, you don't understand why France in 1952 was able to even use a Moroccan-American treaty to try to take the United States to court in the first place. You know why? Because Morocco was under the jurisdiction of France. France was the ruling power of Morocco at the time until 1956. So, So I said, this is not important to the plight of American freedmen descendants. Look at what he says. We are not freedmen. That is the names of the colonizers and not a matter of international court. <laughs> this is what, what he said. What does that even mean? This what is a bunch of nonsense. Even mean? It's, it's nonsense. It's Ignorant Bible. <laughs> so it goes on Come and on, on and on, right? And then what he did was, what he did was he posted the Jewish name Friedman. F-R-I-E-D-M-A-N. Right, Fried, so let me let me Friedman. stop. Friedman, they pronounce it Friedman. So let, let me just share that real quick because we're gonna we're gonna go into what that name mean what that name means, and it has absolutely nothing to do with someone being it's, emancipated. It's, it's, it's almost kind of how like Chief Top Clown was calling the Timucua Indians Tamiquas. <laughs> they don't even know how to read, the and they want to educate us about what the hell's going and on. This, you mean Tamika and them from down the street? Tamika and from them. the next building over. All right, so <laughs> so let's do this real quick. Friedman, this is the name that he pulled up, which is a surname, right? And I tried to explain to him, we're not talking about Friedman in the sense of a sur, a Jewish surname. We're talking about the status that former slaves occupied once they were emancipated during the free during the time of Reconstruction. He ignored that and he decided he was going to post the Jewish surname Friedman. So I said, so he, this is what it is. The the name Friedman, and someone else brought this up on Twitter uh, about a week or so ago too. They brought this name up. I don't know if you remember that logic. The name Friedman is a proud symbol of ancient Jewish culture. Before the late Middle Ages, people were known only by a single name. However, as the population increased and travelers set out on their journeys, it became necessary for people to adopt a second name to identify themselves, et cetera, et cetera. So let's go down to the bottom. The Ashkenazic Jewish name Friedman is an ornamental name derived from the Yiddish word Frid, which means peace. Every <laughs> source that you pull up about this <laughs> Jewish name Friedman is going to tell you that it is rooted in the word peace. That's what that name is stems from. Freedmen as it pertains to those people who are emancipated in the United States has nothing to do with the Jewish word peace. It's not even spelled the same way. That's right. It's not That's even spelled right. the same way. So what All right, does so let's, 
That's, that's, so we that's have to, I have to that. ask him. If that was the Jewish man's name, if that was a Jewish man's name, if that was a Jewish man's name, and our origin is it Freeman, then obviously they stapled the name on us. What are you talking about, bro? Hold on, bro. Stop, stop, stop. What are you talking about, bro? What are you talking about? Bro? What are you talking about? <laughs> He just said that it is a Jewish name, right? And no, he just right. showed. He didn't see. say that. Hold on, he just see. showed you in the etymology <laughs> that it's a Jewish name. It's not nothing he made up. Okay. But it's not our last he, name. Nobody's not taking this same. on as a it's surname. Not, it's and not that. Right. Hold on, it's let me make a point. As, hold on, hold on, as a hold on, hold on. Let me make a point. No, they didn't. Joshua hit and chill, bro. You're about to You'll get listen. a lesson. Hold on, hold on. Listen, Just listen. Chill. Let me tell you this, Joshua. Listen, you don't know a lot, right? You don't. You don't know a lot. You're. You're <laughs> you not cool right now. You're, you're, you're being. You're being very uncool right now, Josh. Just listen. I'm just letting y'all back in the legislation itself that we're talking about. It's never spelled the way that you're talking about. So to and it specifically outlines who they're talking about. Those Jewish Ashkenazis were not those chattel slaves that is written and described about in the actual legislation. You bringing up these Jews is a matter of immaterial. You are not equipped to have this conversation. You have gotten way in way over your head. You are confused beyond Freeman untanglement. The from? term Freedman in American right intent is right here. You got to go into America. See, your mind is so off of America, you don't you don't know where you're at. You're disoriented. You don't even know where you think you're in Morocco when you're probably in New Jersey. You understand? So you have to you have to get yourself together. You need some help. <laughs> and this is sick. This is sick. <laughs> you understand? You, you don't Morocco even understand that you New sound Jersey. crazy. You think that you don't even understand how crazy you sound because you're talking about a last name of a specific group of people and you're trying to say that that's what we're talking about when we're talking about specific legislation about a word that's spelled different with a different legislative definition. We're talking about law and policy. You're talking about the last name of some fucking Jews somewhere. We're talking about what the government identified a specific group of people who they talked about at length to ad nauseum, they talked about and described the attributes, the origins, where they came from. Called them African. Talked about the fear of a Negro majority That's rule. Right. Called them you just reading that stuff. E E D E M, and you're talking about some nut shit. And you wanted us to respect that. And then when we come and we start talking to you like that, people want to say, oh, BTP being bullies. No, we don't respect this bullshit. Bro, I ain't about. Saying so get yourself I'm together. All no, I you're wrong. You and you need. No, no, no. Stop. 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 We, stop. We're stop. not. You, you have it's said the enough. Same, you, the same maybe you're not a Freeman. Yeah, where you you're, from, bro? Where you from? Because maybe he's an immigrant. That's that's he true. Where you from? Because he I am an immigrant. I know we're not Freemans. Okay, wait a minute. Where are you from? Where's your family it from? It has to Look, matter. Why does it matter? Because okay, we Ali, said it matters. Read now, what where you are you from? Ali, if my Ali, name read what you have on the screen, Ali. Where I'm from don't matter. All I right. No, 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 no. Hold on, Joshua. Josh. Hold yes, on, Joshua. Josh. These You're are the... a high quality education tonight. Ali, he, can you read what's he, on the screen, bro? Go ahead. He read. Ask where does the Freeman that we use come from? The word that's Freeman spelled differently in Roman law, one who was set free from a state of bondage, an emancipated slave. The word is used in the same sense same in sense. the United States, respecting, the United States. respecting Negroes. Negroes who were formerly slaves. Not Jews that had a name. So listen, this that is all control. I was saying. We all can't talk at the same time. All I was saying when we were having the conversation in the in the <laughs> inbox, I didn't say that our people weren't named freedmen when they got freed from slaves. I was talking about having it as a surname. You never specify in this inbox. I'm looking I at said it. that we're not talking about surname. You said, said that right now. On the post. He I'm just talking. read it. He uh, just why? read it. All right, cool. We're not dealing cool. with the same person. We're not dealing with the same person. We all literally just had it on live and read it. Like, what the hell are That's we That's right. We about? just read it on live, dude. What are you talking about, man? You came on here. You don't know what you're talking about. You need to get educated. We asked you, where are you from? What's your family background? You refuse to give us that. You're just saying stuff. 
And that's the problem with a lot of you. And that's one of the reasons why we wanted to bring you on tonight to serve in as, as an example. We didn't bring you up here to clown you or anything to that nature. Yo, and Ali is just Kato really had a, Kato, yo, Kato really had a good question. He says, so when native black Americans were called freedmen after slavery, he was saying we were being called Jews. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, man, yo, see, he gets like, like, see, what he doesn't understand, right? What he that doesn't understand, hilarious. what a lot of them dudes in the Moorish, so called Moorish movement, don't understand is that a lot of that shit is ridiculous, ridiculous, right? And because they don't have anybody to really scrutinize it, and because they don't talk to people like us on a regular basis, they That's run right. on and on and on, and they continuously adopt all of this bullshit from people like Tar Sharik Bay Dane and Calloway. Dane Calloway, etc. Like the brother tried to tell me Dane Legendary Calloway was right caps. about everything that he was saying. So look, let me just read this, right? So people can see this was from a day ago. You look at the bottom of it and you'll see that it was a day ago, right? And he actually hit the like button on this thing. See his name down there? Joshua Hinton. He hit the like button on it. So I'm going <laughs> okay. to show you where School. I said we're not it's talking cool, about professor. No damn last names right here Dan, i said dan is wrong about a lot and it's very easy to prove which we've done at btp on a number of occasions you said freeman was the name of the colonizer and then contradictorily said it cannot be the last name because it's not a noun i said i didn't say it was anyone's last name and people have all sorts of last names regardless of the part of speech it may belong to that's what was said and you know what he did he hit the like button on it. There's his name. This is a day ago. It's right here. <laughs> so he's right. trying to tell me what oh, was not crazy. said. I remember the conversation perfectly well. See, when you're a dishonest broker and you're you're used to being a dishonest a dishonest broker, I think that you 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 confuse yourself. And then, as the white supremacists have done in the history of this nation, as we've highlighted in the book, The Bloody Shirt, you try to pass that confusing element on to us and make it seem like we're the ones who are confused no, or no, we no. are the All ones I'm that are confusing. Was, I, I we are very wrong. clear. And I can, I can take that if I'm wrong and I can accept that. I, I'm, I'm, I'm well, so then accept it right now, brother. Accept the truth and set yourself free. Say that. that you was wrong. You Go ahead and say I'm wrong. Say it. BS. I no, hey, Joshua. Joshua Hinton. Joshua Hinton. Joshua Wait, pull out our are you mortgages man and enough? deeds for what? Please. Are you man Wait a minute, enough? Hold, are you hold on. on? Are you man enough to logic. admit you were wrong? He's just going to yes. keep talking about a lot of stuff we got. Okay, first. so you was so man just go okay. ahead and admit it he for did. the people tonight. Admit I just it for the people said tonight. that. I said I can admit. Say it when again. I, was I missed wrong, it. And I was wrong. Okay, you was there wrong. There you go. Thank okay, you. Okay, so bro. now okay. you want us. Now you want us to pull out our mortgages and our deeds for what? You stated the mortgage. The 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 Morris BS. That's what you said, right? Referring to what we know, at our knowledge on Morse. And I want to show you how I own these lands with allodial titles. Oh, God. Bye. Get him out of here. Get him out of here. Get him out of here. This dude is bugged out. Like, this is stuff myself and, and Ali especially uh, yeah. had debunked. <laughs> yeah. 2021 we uh, started debunking this stuff literally 10 years ago see he doesn't know us obviously yo, what did he say hold he on. don't know that hold we on. the, the god you this. can't leave right you can't leave logic out like i ain't no 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 we ain't leaving you out we ain't leaving you out but me and ali oh, no. been doing this since like 2011 2012 you know what i'm saying when you <laughs> We when start I, linking up in 2014. Yeah, you know, yeah, Abba, you Abba got me out of that madness. Board. I was trying to file right. affidavids right. too. I was trying that's to file right. affidavids too. Abba I went that brother. brother logic going live. Like, like, hold on, brother, you're gonna get yourself alone. in trouble with that. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> A what, did he, what did he say? <laughs> say it again, family. What he did that man say? these lands. He told us to pull out our mortgages and our deeds as if that means anything. See. This is what I'm saying. People don't understand when we say that a lot of what our former leaders and teachers brought us in these, you know, I still give honors because I learned some things from me, <laughs> but it was mission drift. It was mission drift. Point yeah, blank. Yeah. And yeah, what happens when you do mission man. drift is you start drifting off more and more and your, and your mind starts to wander from the center. So Noble Drew Ali is the center, and he never taught 
alloidio titles and none of the other nonsense that Joshua Hinton, who claims to Aloidious be a Alloidius titles. <laughs> Aloidio. Aloidio. This is, Aloidio. That's some um, I, I don't give a fuck what he was talking that, about. That's like feudal labels and stuff. Anyway. Yo, I'm feeling, I'm, feeling, I'm feeling my shame on a nigga who tried to <laughs> my game on a nigga. What? <laughs> what? Hey, yo, what? Score, yo. BTP Stop like playing. you. Hey, yo, we like to woo up in here. Stop playing with us, man. My yo, man was Come on, beat up now we half-stepping. We gonna Yo, stop trying to come at the run, free, man. And let me run. tell you something. See, that's the reason why we see we we like to be peaceful. You understand? But we're not harmless. And that's why we have to go at we have we have to go at them top cats and we have to go at them dang clown aways and we have to and, let and, all these and Ishmael balls. Bay. We Ishmael you out, weirdos. Ish, we know you watching. We call we it have Ishmael to get at Bay out too. Cause look how stupid you got our people sounding. Look how stupid you got our people sounding. We, we, we don't take joy in this. I ain't gonna lie. We take a little bit of joy in this, right? But we're we're we're, 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 we're tell we're, about the but, laughter. But it's sad that we have to do this work That's to right. clean up all of this mess that y'all have That's contributed right. and keep contributing to making. Nothing prosperous can come from this foolishness. You understand? And 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 we and we we not playing. We're not we not playing no more. We see y'all in clubhouse. We 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 hopped off at a clubhouse. We then saw how everybody started getting crazy. Everybody's just doing anything on clubhouse. We back on clubhouse. That's right. We brought Ali and we brought Ali with us. And we, and we brought got the great Ali, Ali we got with the us. Professor with us. Stop playing. You understand? We're not playing with y'all. Yeah. So watch what y'all say in the rooms. Club you never know when one of the freedmen gonna pop up. You understand? That's right. And and it's some stuff already got back to me, but I ain't saying nothing about it. I'm chilling. You know what I'm saying? Mm. So it is what it is, right? But we 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 about to take over Clubhouse because the freedman energy is needed. People have they took the title, and I guess because I I don't know what the hell it was. They they went back to using stuff that really has no rele, re, relevance mm. in American legislation in the first place. But what we're using has re relevance. I don't know why I keep saying relevance. Relevance in American legislation. I just read it from this book. For those of you who came on late, go back and start from the beginning of this program. The bloody shirt, the freedmen are in the records. The freedmen, let's pull that up, man. The freedmen are in the records in this country. And it is, you can't deny it. It's undeniable. That's who we are. That's what we need to be fighting for. That's what we need to be fighting for. These That's your people, Freeman 101 I, history right there. Get the your Freeman, Freeman 101, 101 right, right there. there. Let me just read this, this sentence. Again, man, it's so this much comes in this from book, Provisional man. Governor Perry. Re real quick. It says, it was a necessary condition for South Carolina's readmission to the Union that their state include a like declaration in their state's New Constitution, talking about the 13th Amendment, or else they wouldn't have got readmitted. He said, until this is done, we shall be kept under military rule, and the Negroes will be protected as quote-unquote freedmen. These are his words. And what they did was... Pro, hold on, hold on, stop. Maybe, us of the word, real quick, so, they stripped can you repeat us of it, the repeat word it. freedmen. Repeat that, uh -huh. because maybe Joshua Hinton is still listening. Please Hopefully, repeat Joshua that. Joshua Hinton is still listening. Until this is done, we shall be kept under military rule and the Negroes, which is what they called our people, will be, they ain't called no Jews Negroes. Nobody named Friedman or Friedman. <laughs> they ain't called them Negroes. They called our people Negroes. It says, and the Negroes will be protected as quote unquote freemen. He put the quotation marks. The racist slave owner, provisional mm -hmm. Governor Perry, he put those quotation marks there by the military rule. And the Negroes will be protected as freedmen by the whole military of the force of the United States. And what they did was slowly but surely <clears throat> remove the name freedmen out of the legislation. They removed it out of the history. So by the time you get to the early 1900s, this term freedmen from 1860. Five on. Think about it. That's what, 35 years? By the early 1900s, you barely even see the word freedman. By the 1920s, this word, you, you don't see it at all. Think about Martin Luther King Jr. He got, I guess, revisions of 
the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act passed. The Voting Rights Act was really just the 15th Amendment that was passed, right? And I'm and I said I guess revisions of them because that's what I believe. I, I guess that these were just revisions of things that we already had on the books. No use of the term freedman is in that language. Family, we are in the process of the real reconstruction 2.0. The descendants of the freedmen have risen and it is time for us to take our place in the affairs of men. It is time for us to implement strategies. Go to our website, www.bethepower.org. I just put our 12 point political agenda in the chat. Read it, study it, memorize it. If you're gonna be a Freedman organization, you should, we believe, build your platform off of it because it's rooted in the things that we have to fight against. This is not rooted in the whims of our egos. This is rooted in the overthrow of reconstruction. Read those 12 points and you're gonna see them for yourself if you are studied on the history because we're studying the history. And if you read Dr. Darity and A. Kirsten Mullins' book, From Here to Equality, Reparations for Black Americans in the 21st Century, then you already know. Do a keyword search and see how many times Friedman comes up in that book if you have Kindle. And you're going to see that it comes up a lot of times as well. And you're going to see the same thing, that the term Friedman starts to fade away and it gets replaced by the term Negro. And we have Black today and African American, which apparently applies to everybody, Black and Afri African American, who have origins in the continent of Africa, which is why we have to fight for this freedman designation, family. We have again, to fight for it. Again, you got to proclaim it and preserve it the same way the descendants of the freedmen of the five slaveholding tribes are doing to this very day. They're, right. they're, they're, like I said, they're wise enough to maintain that connection to that freedman lineage and that name it, because it specifically ties them to those treaties of 1866, et cetera. So they, they understand that and they're wise enough to know that, right? So, you, you know, they, that's the thing that we have to do. We got to make sure that we tie ourselves into those things that was put there specifically for us. Go ahead, bro. Yeah, I just I just searched Friedman in this in this book you mentioned fifty eight times. That's fifty eight times in and from then, here to equality. No, this is this is this is um the bloody shirt. Oh, the bloody shirt. Okay, my bad, my bad. Yeah, and then that's let I me mean, just change Friedman. I'm gonna change it to freed man. That's a whole lot of times for freed man nine. So that's nine, over sixty seven times. You know? So we, we see this is our name, family. Look, people can do what they want to do. We're not trying to force anybody nope. to do anything at all. But I'm not, y'all already know what our beef is with certain individuals that want to use acronyms and hashtags, right? What? And it was, it was, let me say, it was meant. It was meant, all of that, the beef, the moving of, out of that space, with those people that we felt were cult members following cult leaders. And I'm going to be honest there because it's already on the videos that we have up on our channel. And we don't walk none of that stuff back. Nothing that was said. Not one word of it. Not one iota of it at all. But if that's what y'all want to do, that's, do that. But you cannot escape nor argue nor win any debate with us who are freedmen today about us using this term freedman this is our ancestral name right there, it not only represents the name it represents a status that we have that's why provisional governor perry said that we gotta adopt this or else the federal government is going to protect them as freedmen that's why i brought up the compromise of 1877 earlier between tilden and hayes where the military forces were removed from the South and the Klan and all of these different 
devils were able to mob up because they couldn't face one of us one on one. They they just couldn't. This, exactly. This is a powerful piece he pulled up, and it, and it really kind of goes to underscore the point that these people understand their connection to that term. Go ahead, Josh. What, what you yeah. want to say? So. Deb Highland, I guess that's how you pronounce her name, is actually the uh, secretary of the interior. But before she was the secretary of the interior, she was um, congressional representative of the first district of New Mexico. And she she actually, you know, she's actually a member. I think she's a member of the Cherokee or Choctaw. I can't remember which which tribe she's a part of. So when you think about how Democrats do. They think they're checking the quote unquote BIPOC, you know what I'm saying, boxes. And they think that they're doing something liberal by putting somebody who's from an Indian tribe in as a secretary of the interior instead of just a white person that's connected to some other type of interest. Right. And they think that that's like a, a, a good thing for inclusivity and civil rights and et cetera, et cetera. But then they got to think about like these aren't just people from a, the quote unquote civilized tribes. These are the five slaveholding tribes. And we said this on a program a few weeks ago. Uh, and I, I said it. I said it. Right. <laughs> and I'm thinking, man, that's that's a that's a novel thing right there. That's a that's a powerful like assessment. But these people, this, they, they've been saying it. it just goes to show you like how when you're operating. Right, it's in right the right the vibration page. with the right spirit of the ancestors. When you going, when you doing, up going in the right direction, it's a lot of people going to see that t that truth, right? So let me read this. I'm just going to read it real quickly. It says we call we call on Representative Deb Highland to publicly pledge her support for citizenship and equal rights for freedmen of the five tribes in Indian Territory before being confirmed as Secretary of the Interior and to outline and commit to a plan to, for freedmen integration and inclusion in Indian Territory. We demand accountability from Representative Deb Highland of New Mexico's 1st Congressional District for her exclusion of the legislative protections for freedmen for the five slaveholding tribes of Oklahoma so while serving as before. New Mexico's 1st Congressional District's representative. See, See, they took a politician who was operating to maintain Jim, Jim Crow against the 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 uh, the freedmen of the five slaveholding tribes, right? Who imagine that? Imagine the person like a Strom Thurmond type of person uh, or, or a, a, a Jim Crow segregationist get excuse me getting elected to Secretary of the Interior, or you know that's crazy. Right. But that's what that's what happened with that's what happened to the freedmen of, of the of the slaveholding tribes. Right. So it says as freedmen of the five southeastern tribes, Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw Creek and Seminole Nations now located in Oklahoma. We have preca precarious relationships with our tribes of origin. Freedmen descend from those enslaved by tribal members of the in the 1700s and 1800s, as well as native people who had been tribal members since before European contact and free black people who were tribal citizens and members at the time of Dawes enrollment in the late 1800s. With the treaties of 1866, all five of the Southeastern tribes abolished slavery and promised their freedmen's citizenship and equal rights. However, in all of these tribes, but the Cherokee nation, and we got to add, that wasn't t up until recently when they got they started uh, including them, right? Freedmen are either deny, denied tribal citizenship rights or deemed second-class citizens. In the Seminole Nation, Seminole freedmen are enrolled as partial and unequal tribal members and are counted when the Seminole Nation requests federal funding, but are excluded from any tribal housing, health care, or educational programs, or funding on account of their race. A modern three-fifths compromise. Doesn't a lot of this sound familiar? That's right. In the Choctaw. In Chickasaw and Creek nations, freedmen are not only denied housing, health care and educational programs, but are also denied basic citizenship and voting rights on account of their race and not just on account of their race and their ancestors statuses as black and or enslaved people. Choctaw, Chickasaw, and Creek Freedmen are also excluded from protections afforded Native ch uh, children in the Indian Child Welfare Act on account of being excluded from tribal citizenship. These modern day Jim Crow policies can no longer be tolerated. Look, 
So check this out. Right. I mean, let, me, let me just finish reading this paragraph. It says, we need a secretary of the interior who will enforce the five, civil, uh, the five tribes treaty obligations to freedmen who will investigate and discriminatory Jim Crow policies in, in Indian territory. So let me say this. So the, the freedmen who we just said, Abraham Lincoln said it, it, you couldn't have won the war without us, right? We save a whole lot of people, right? We we the we not only did we fight and and and, oh and uh, save ourselves through whooping the Confederates in the Civil War, right? Because they a lot of times they say, well, the Civil War that was your reparations. Well, wait a minute, half of y'all uh fought to keep us yeah, in keep slavery. Going, Josh. Keep going, Josh. Right. Keep half going. of y'all fought point. to keep us in slavery. The other half was was getting whooped by the other half that was wanted to be, keep us in slavery. It took us to come and die by. That's right. Uh, 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 um, uh, a third of the, a third of the two hundred thousand, pretty much died. Uh, sixty six thousand, or six, something like that. Seventy some thousand of the two hundred thousand died. You know, in the Civil War. So not only did we save ourselves, not only did we save uh, America, the nation. Not only did we save uh, the 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 Cherokee and the Choctaw Chickasaw Creek uh, Seminole freedmen. We save a whole lot of white folks in the North. In, because guess what? Those Confederates, as we you, as you probably read in this book, and I, I'm, I hope on the next program when we have uh, other people on, you can share. Um, you'll see that these devils that were the, the Confederates, they were killing white folks like it was nothing. They they have they told you how they felt about a scalawag and a carpetbagger. It's another part. It's another piece in here. I, I don't want to read it because it's going to elongate, but. They were saying, hey, if this one win the election, he going to die. If this one is a Republican, if he win, he going to die. And he just named like, all these. If they win, all of them dying. They were spilling blood in the street. <laughs> talk, talk to him, Josh. Yeah. So when you when you read this right now, now let me let me just continue on. So it says. Representative Deb Haaland's past legislative actions indicates that she is not a strong supporter of protections for black native freedmen of the five tribes of Oklahoma. In December 2019, Representative Haaland co-sponsored a bipartisan bill to reauthorize the Native American Housing Assistance and Self-Determination Act through 2024 to remove protections for freedmen of the five tribes that had previously been included in bills reauthorizing the funding. Although constituting only five of the 573 recognized tribes in the United States, the U.S. Department of Her uh, uh, HUD has informed the five tribes that they can expect to receive 10 percent of the program's funding, over 62 million in funding for the program. However, as it currently stands, four out of the five tribes receiving this large amount of funding would exclude freedmen from it solely on account of their race and or due to being descendants of black slaves. As freedmen, we believe that our tribes must follow uh, their own treaties and basic human rights and civil rights principles in order to receive taxpayer uh, funded resources. And now it's talking about how she was, um, she's, you know, Biden actually did make her uh, secretary of the interior. And they're asking, they're asking them to uphold the, the, the um, all that stuff. What, what, a, what a lot of people don't understand is Cherokee kids, Cherokee uh, tribal members, when they turn 18 years old, they receive, I think this year is up to $168,000 a person. That's how they split their profits that come from, you know, the, the businesses that they get cut in on. When a, when a, a, a freedman does everything they're supposed to do, when I'm talking about a freedman, whether you uh, a member of the tribe or whether you of the United States freedmen, right? Not connected to no tribe because you don't have access. If you do everything you're supposed to do, let's say you get go to Howard University. Howard University, uh, logic. What's the tuition on a yearly basis for Howard University? Remember we looked it up. One of like fifty thousand or something like that. Man, I think it was like fifty two thousand. Yeah, it was multiple at that times four. So let's just say it's 40, let's say it's 40,000, 42,000, right? Let's say it's 42,000. 42,000 times four is 168,000. So by those freedmen, not, if, if those freedmen do what they're supposed to do, they go to Howard, they could, uh, they get a hundred, their net worth is negative 168,000. If they was getting included into tribe, into the tribe and they didn't go to school, they would be positive 168,000. So I'm just trying to show you like us, the freedmen that built America, 
not that was associated with tribes that fought for the Confederacy. Like we get zero. Matter of fact, we get hit with all kind of abuses and all this kind of stuff, right? So we have a common, you know, uh, uh, a moniker that we're using. We're talking about Freeman. They, the stuff that they're talking about, it's 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 right along what we what we talking about. But one of the things I just think that's interesting is they put pressure on this Deb Howland, and what was the outcome? We saw it. Maxine Waters. It took Maxine Waters a Freeman, right? Started advocating for them to get federal funds with her, withheld for, from those uh, five slave owner tribes. And now those people, those tribes are now considering making these people citizens and, and, and uh, uh, being included in, in their tribes. So, hey, man, all I'm showing. I'm, we, had to I'm force saying it, is, we had to force them to do that in the outstart. Yeah, and what I'm seeing is that Freedman, um, that pushing that Freedman on them, it really takes it back to something they can't avoid. When you put that Freedman, uh, language on them, them and that Freedman history on them, you cannot get around that. It, they they take you cannot it, escape it, from Reconstruction. They you cannot escape them, from all yeah. of the stuff that we talked about in that bloody shirt. Them five tribes specifically when they didn't use it, right? Ali talked about the wisdom. You explained it, right? Now they they tie themselves into something real, something already on the record, something that has never been undone. That led those treaties have never been undone. There has never been no laws to undo what those treaties, uh, uh, the, the the Cherokee Treaty in '66 and the the different Freedmen treaties with the five uh, slave holding tribes. The, nothing on the federal level has been done to 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 change those uh, legal conditions you understand in the in the in the in the foundational sense in the in the base sense right the same as right and see they they know that that that's why they invoke that name freedman because they know it's still politically uh, and uh judicially relevant and in and, and powerful and meaningful the same way for us there has nothing been done to overturn the civil rights act of 1866 nothing has overturned the uh the uh, freedman acts of 1865 or 66 there is no federal legislation undoing that we just stopped going off of it we stopped fighting for it. Right. They, the, the, the the terrorism and the oppression was so great in the south the murders was so rampant the violence the criminal activity was so lawless that we had to flee. They called it the Great Migration, right? We had to get up out of there. They put the, the federal government didn't undo our condition through act of legislation. It wasn't an act of Congress that did, uh, undid the 14th Amendment that was supposed to get uh, 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 e protection under the law. It was an act of violence that did it, an act of crime. A crime and the, that crime is still in progress to this day. You understand? And so what we're saying now in this day and time, we're living in a different time socially, right? Legally and lawfully, there has nothing been done to undo the provisions and protections granted to the freedmen now. That's why we are connecting and tying ourselves back into that constitutional fold that articulates the freedmen's justice and protection. You understand? Because it's still there. It still exists. Nothing has been done to overrule it, to undo it, to abolish it. It's still law right now. You understand? What we have to do is proclaim that. What, what we just discussed and showed you is like, we often hear people talk about why we want to be made a, a protected class. We were already made a protected class. The first protected class was the class of freedmen. Free. That was the first protected class in America. That's and they right. did it with constitutional legislation and constitutional law. Civil, the first Civil Rights Act, given civil rights guarantees and protections, was made for the freedmen. Protect the the equal protection under the law uh, 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 amendment. The Fourteenth Amendment was for the freedmen. You understand? Max. And we're Max. the ones. We're the first protected class. We are the protected class. You just got to tell the government that. You got to say, "Hey, the freedmen still here. That's us." You got to proclaim that to them. Keep this right. logic. Look at look at what. Mm -hmm. The United States government calls African American heritage. They deem this whole freedman history as a part of your heritage. Mm, you come on, man. This is a part of your heritage. And they Ooh, give you a whole breakdown. 
and this look this is this ain't me this is what they said see it's right there african american heritage the african american records in the freedmen's bureau right this is your stuff this is your stuff right we ain't got to make up nothing we don't have to do it because it's already there they telling you this is your heritage right here you can claim it or leave it alone that's on you that's right but there's birthrights under that you got birthrights damn under straight that. god damn that come on yo that's a fact that's a fact you no know, your life liberty and pursuit of happiness is veiled and enveloped in your freedom and identity it's specific just for us you understand everybody talk about how do we access the equity how do we but you don't understand that reconstruction was a crime that's why they don't teach it reconstruction the way it went down was unconstitutional it was overthrown that's why they don't teach it so you know you what you you have the strongest civil rights and constitutional justice claim in the history of the country but that's only right. a certain group of people can make it and that's us the freedmen and until you start proclaiming that understanding that history and learn educating yourself on how to make that that fight and how to make that claim and how to talk about it right and if you're not talking of the freedman identity is the missing key yeah, but what we just talking about the other day was like that's what dr the great great dr king that's, that's right. all they were missing they that's they were hitting missing. on it they got at it but they missed that's they right. missed the freedman part they missed that freedman part and that's what they were missing because the government already admitted, made sure that they was going to do right. They already capitulated to our argument. Our argument ain't new. It's a continuation. And, and we're going to do a stream on the late, great Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in the very near future. So y'all make sure y'all stay tuned to that as well. Ali, can you drop that link in the chat so that people can follow it and, and pull it up and peruse at their leisure. Oh, this one right here? Oh, yeah. Hold on. All right, I'm going to stop sharing it. And then we'll just... Uh, what you want? First, which, which chat? In the... Oh, in the uh, <coughs> are you, you... Do you have YouTube open? Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Let me... Will it show up as a chat? Maybe... I mean, as a link? Maybe it will. Yeah, 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 definitely. You are all right, yeah, I put, okay, yeah. there it is. I just threw it in there. Yeah, man, I mean, you know how the old saying go, take it or let it alone. That's on you. <laughs> it's up to you, man. But you can run with some old contrived stuff if you want, but I, I'm I'm yeah. not doing it. I'm telling That's you right. right now, I'm not doing it. You know, whoever, you grown, you do whatever you want, but I'm just saying, I am not doing it, period. No, count That's me right. out. Yeah. Count me out. If you're serious about this thing, you would want to be as right as possible. If you're serious about it, you would just say, well, damn, whatever is right, whatever's getting me closer to victory, that's what I'm going to roll with. Yeah, I don't care about personalities. I don't care about clicks. I don't care about none of that shit. What's the best equipment? And what's the best evidence? And like, th if you're really a reparationist and you're serious about this thing, that's how you'd be looking at it. So you'll be like, oh, I don't care about that. No, oh, this makes sense here. Oh, shit. Well, I can't refute that. And you'll start using, you'll start moving like that, right? But that's why you got to understand. Are you, ask yourself, do a self inventory. Am I serious about reparations? Am I truly a reparationist? You understand? Then you'll know what you need to do. Nothing about what we said can be refuted in any way, in any real way. If you want, if you want to be victorious in this fight for reparations, repair, and our full uh birthrights and stake and uh, freedman heritage you have to roll with the freedman banner it's the only thing that's proven to be successful in that's american right. politics from that's our right. vantage point anyway and y'all see yeah. the muscle getting bigger we flexing a little we flexing a little bit more that muscle getting bigger <laughs> <laughs> we flexing a little bit more you know we the power Man, like, look, man, I feel like I feel like we didn't even really get a chance to get into this book. No, you know? we didn't. We it's might so come many on points. tomorrow night, though. We might come on tomorrow night. I mean, look, I mean, I'm just reading this one clip right now. I, I was like, man, I, I wanted to get to this. I wanted to get to this. <sighs> this, I mean, man. It, I, it's I, so I much because it, it goes got to read this last clip. Everything. Hmm? Yeah, hmm? It's so much. You want me to so save it for tomorrow? All right, I, I can save it for tomorrow. Because right, I got a good one yeah. they could run with. 
From another one so from many. Abraham Lincoln. It's so many. Abraham and Lincoln. Told, I, do y'all want? Ooh, boy. Uh, I got uh, something uh, I could bust with about Abe Lincoln. <laughs> <laughs> but oh, go yeah. ahead, go. Because see, you was working at the the library. Look, uh, Abraham Lincoln wrote a letter to Andrew Johnson in 1863, and he said to him, the colored population is the great available and yet unavailed of force for restoring the Union, for restoring the Union. The bare sight of 50,000 armed and drilled black soldiers on the banks of the Mississippi would end the rebellion at once. This is what Abraham Lincoln said. Just the sight of 50,000 armed black men looking crazy. He said, just seeing them going to have them those uh, Confederates so shook that they're going to stop as soon as they see these dudes. This is what Abraham Lincoln said. That's crazy. That's right. That is. Hey, Josh, unmute. unmute. Because I don't care how bad your hatred for us is. It's not going to be stronger than our fighting for freedom and retribution is on you. That's right. And they knew that. They knew that. They so knew it. that's why they tried to keep us out of power. Yeah. That was their goal. Yeah. Because we represented justice. We were the most docile mm -hmm. and, and we were the embodiment people. of justice. We were the right? instruments and when we of stay justice. Peaceful, uh, Brother Logic did a tweet earlier that said in order to be peaceful, you have to be capable of exerting <laughs> violence. Mm -hmm. right? Great violence. Great violence. Great violence. And, uh <laughs> Those whom are harmless, well, those those people are not, and and you have some harmless, you have some who are very harmless, but we at be the power, we are peaceful. So, on the flip side of that, we tell you what we are capable of, and that's what's needed to help move this movement forward, point blank. Period. So. Hey, this is Longstreet. To prove your point, Naheem, then I'm going to shut up. Um, Longstreet, it says, the highest of human laws is a law that is established by appeal to arms. The sword has decided in favor of the North, and what they claimed as principles cease to be and what and what they claim as principles cease to be principles and are, bec and are become law. Yeah, so yeah, that violence they made that happen, mm -hmm. and that made that sword became the law, and that's it. When you read how they was just shooting our people and Northerners to to smithereens, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know if that term was used. And you think about some of the videos we see of you know the hood dudes get. This was rooted in American violence. It was rooted in the violence of the confederacy these devils of the south so you think that these people are scared of you no oh no we are different and we're moving and operating in a whole different frame of mind that's why I, like i said earlier i honor the people especially to those of us who were living in the north north us first slash second gen northerners. I honor those who brought us that particular fighting spirit that was, I'm, I'm not going to say it wasn't in the South, but it just wasn't in the South like it was in the North. I honor them. I honor them because it made us poke our chest out a little bit more. It made us say things that a quote unquote Negro wouldn't say to a quote unquote white man in the south up in the north we paid for it but we fought we fought like hell so we might do a part two tomorrow night i'm pretty certain we will there's so much that i mean i haven't even cracked any of my notes on this uh, besides we, we this. just touched the surface tonight <laughs> we just man. touched the surface there's so, so much horror and glory in this book man that's right that's right so you know family y'all tune in if you are new to the channel make sure that y'all subscribe we're going to be putting these sweaters back out free you the free you hats free you means freedman university it's a double entendre free you 
because what we're doing at Be The Power and the United Sons and Daughters of Freedmen is to help you liberate your mind from a lot of the nonsense that we have accepted as some form of truth or history or facts. And that guy, Joshua Hinton, who was on earlier, was a prime example of that. He was a prime example of someone, as we were once, devoid of this history, devoid of these facts. And if we can pull our people out of the, the pits of ignorance, then that's exactly what we're going to do. We have to do that. This duty is laying upon us as freedmen, as the descendants of our freedom, freedom fighting and so I'm just hyped tonight, so my words are just jumbling up all over the place because I feel the energy right now. I feel the wings of my, my ancestors on my back carrying me, carrying my brethren, carrying my peoples in the chat right now. We're few, That's right. but we're That's powerful. Right. Remember that, right. family. We're few. We talked about a lot of good powerful. things. I want the takeaways, right? We're few, but we're smart. And we were, we've always been the few in this country relative to our opposition. But what did we do? And what did they fear the most? We talked about it tonight and we read their admissions of fear. A Negro majority, which comes back to a strategy that's in our platform, talking about the return to our states of origin to strategically lo relocate ourselves in the South. To, so that we can reproduce those Negro majorities, you understand, so that we can access states rights dominance, the state right power so that we can be the majority that installs U.S. senators and governors and whatnot into power. And that is the ultimate play. A lot of times you think that we've tried everything. We've tried everything. We just need to separate and do it. That's not, you haven't tried everything, family. You haven't That's tried right. to strategically locate ourselves as a group back into uh, the countries of origin to create state majority so that in this era and time now, this electrified age that we're in, this That's technological right. age that we're in, to, to really impact regional government through an act of radical federalism. We've always been federalists, right? The Civil War was an act of radical federalism. Reconstruction was an act of radical federalism. The 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, this 1866 Civil Rights Act was acts of radical federalism. The Civil Rights Movement of the 1900s, uh, 1960s were acts of radical federalism. Our X factor and our uh, secret weapon is civil rights justice, justice work enveloped in radical federalism. You understand? That's what we have to do if we want to get where we need to go in this pursuit for justice. We have, If you really want reparations, you have to have a plan like reverse migration. You have to have real serious ideologies and, and real serious agendas and plans. And if you're going to be on code, it has to be on code with what? The plan. The plan is in your agenda and in your platform and in your calling card. Our calling card is American freedom. You understand? So go on Clubhouse, go on Twitter, go wherever you need to go, Facebook and whatnot, and let everybody know who you are and where you come from and what <laughs> your position is here in America. Peace. Oh, Yo, Josh is, Josh is hilarious. He's, he got off because he said, I didn't even want to be tempted to say anything else because you know how he do. So he, so he jumped off. But look, <laughs> let <laughs> Let me just say this, and I, I'm going to reiterate it, you know, after showing that link from the National Archives, where it's telling you that this Freedman history is your heritage. Understand something. A heritage is something that is inherited or it's an inheritance, right? This is what this word heritage means. So I'm saying that this government is telling you that that is your inheritance. That's right. They're telling you that's your inheritance. That's right. And I'm saying it's your inheritance as well. And I'm saying take it or let it alone. That's on you. It's completely on you. But like them Indian tribes, they got sense enough to understand that that's their inheritance. And they keeping that. They keeping it. Indeed. So look, we're going to get up off here. 
This was a powerful, powerful discussion. I believe one of our best discussions, one of our best live streams. You know, we talked about the history. We showed in no uncertain terms how the Freedman name, how the heritage was mentioned in the earliest of this, this country's records and what the Confederates, the rebels, who still exist today, the neo-Confederates and the Republican Party who call themselves conservatives, how it existed and why we must resurrect it. Think about it. They still fly Confederate flags. The only difference is they don't call themselves Democrats anymore. They call themselves Republicans. They brought their con they brought their Confederate flags with them into the, the Republican Party because they didn't like what happened with those civil rights acts in the 60s. You're Dixiecrats. We have to own this thing now. It's ours. It's always been ours. It's our name. Like I said earlier, people can do and use what they want, but you can never get around Friedman, nor can you defeat it. And if you can't defeat it, then why try to fight it? Why try to use anything else? In my opinion, in our opinion, Friedman is what it is. And so long as we use the status name of our ancestors, I believe that we will be successful and that we can reverse this downward trend that our people are mired in and have been mired in for decades. So with that, I'll see y'all tomorrow night. We might as well do it again. Y'all make sure y'all be back on here. We might start a little bit earlier. We might start at 7 if you have read the book, we might invite you on. Matter of fact, we will invite you on to come on and share your thoughts. Share what you believe touched you. What, what hit you when you read this book that made you say, geez, Josh spoke about anger earlier. What angered you? What made you upset? What made you mad? <laughs> you see? So y'all make sure that y'all... Come back tomorrow night. We're going to go in at 7 o'clock. We probably won't stay on this long, but, you know, we need these discussions. These discussions are vital, and we look forward to it, man. Honest to you all for showing up. Honest to my BTP brethren. Honest to, to all the scholars that we have mentioned tonight, and honors to our freedmen ancestry. And I leave y'all with the Motto of the platform, which is don't just fight the power, become the power. And then and only then will you have the power to make a change. And with that, I say peace.